podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, June 6th, 2021. This is episode 1803. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Casper. When it comes to a better night's sleep, Casper's new cooling collection has you covered. Focus on tomorrow. Let Casper handle the rest. Explore Casper's products, mattresses, sheets, pillows, and more at casper.com slash twit1 and use the code twit1 for $100 off select mattresses. And by Nureva. Getting your audio ready for meetings back in the office? Nureva Audio is designed for distancing. It automatically adapts to new room configurations, so you're ready for the new normal and whatever comes next. Learn more at nureva.com slash twit. Why, well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yes, it's time once again to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, supersonic aircraft, space, all that jazz. 8888-ESK-LEO. That's the phone number, 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. Uh, or Canada. Website, if you hear something on the show and you go, oh, oh, I want to write that down. No, you don't have to write it down. James DeRuvo, our scribe, is writing it as we speak. Puts it up there at uh, techguylabs.com. That's the website, techguylabs.com. And um, it's free. There's no sign-up. You can just go in there. There's a search. There are 1,802 shows there. This is 1803. That should be enough. <laughs> Going back to 2004. To cover anything you might want to know. Gosh, if you had a computer that was uh, new in 2004, 17-year-old computer, I think it'd be time to get a new one. But if you if you were looking for information about it, you know, it'll, it, it'll probably be on the website, techguylabs.com. Uh, coming up in a little bit, we're going to talk cars with Sam Abul Samad. Digital photography next hour with Chris Marquardt. Our space guy, Rod Pyle, joins us in hour number three to talk about space. And then, uh, of course, we'll talk about anything that's on your mind. Big story this week. This week, Microsoft... It's very interesting. Microsoft was careful to uh, time this announcement. Because next week, the big story will be whatever Apple talks about it is, inevitably. And actually, I think Apple tomorrow will announce new laptops. So, uh, you know, that'll be something to talk about. And probably a new chip. You know, the successor or the upgrade to the M1 chip they've been uh, shipping on the brand new Macs so far, and on the new iPad. Uh, so that, you know, that'll get a lot of attention tomorrow. iOS 15, Mac OS 12, all that. So Microsoft thought, well, we can't talk about it uh, next week. We don't want to hit the J July 4th weekend. So maybe we better announce it this week. Windows 11. Well, now that's a big story, Leo. Why'd you bury that? Well, maybe it's a big story. It's a big number. It goes to 11. But I don't think it's very likely that it'll be a big difference in uh, the operating system. I, I just don't. Uh, it's going to be a new look and feel based on something called Sun Valley. And I, actually, if you think about it, really, that's all that's changed in Windows going back to Windows XP is just how it looks. Because under the hood, it's still you know kind of the same. They're gonna. Re they they've announced a big redesign of the Microsoft Store. Oh, whoopee! <laughs> uh, they're looking. You know, the it's the Apple envy. I'm sorry to say, is uh, palpable because they're looking over at how much money Apple's making on their App Store and iOS. Uh, Apple added because they made so much money in the App Store on iOS, they added an App Store to Mac OS. Plus, it's helping them with security. So Microsoft added an App Store on Windows, and now they're looking over there, going, "Boy, you know, this is uh, there's is so nice. It's all clean. It's actually there's a, there's a brick and mortar analog because the Apple stores, you know, all maple and glass, and you know, full of shiny faces." Uh, <laughs> And I'm talking about the customers. I mean, it's just a really nice, jam-packed place. And Microsoft, when they had stores, opened up their stores across the hall. 
often in the mall. And the contrast was very clear. I mean, you'd look at the Apple stores full of those people and buying things and stuff and looking and playing and stuff. And Microsoft employees would be just kind of sad sitting there and it was never jammed. But that's, you know, I think that doesn't say anything. That's not, that's, most people uh, who buy uh, PCs don't buy them at a Microsoft store. There's plenty of places you can buy a PC. It's a lot harder to find a place to buy a Mac. So I, I don't blame them. That's not a. That's not something. That's not a reflection on Microsoft, but it is kind of how the stores in the on the com computer stores are kind of like that too. The, the the operating system stores, the Windows Store and the Mac OS Store. The, the Windows Store. There's a lot of I don't know, kind of like copycat apps and stuff. They, they they need to fix it up, and they're gonna they're gonna. That's what the that's what the next version, Windows 11. That's the chief. Update and this new look and feel Sun Valley, which I don't know anything about. I, I wouldn't talk about it anyway. They're going to announce that uh, they're going to have an event on the uh, July, uh, no, June 24th. Is that right? June 24th. They're going to announce that. And uh, so that'll, you know, Windows 11. There you have it. Th there you go. <laughs> uh, I don't think they're aiming this at a business audience, honestly. I think they're really aiming it as a home audience because businesses don't want upgrades in the in operating systems too often. They don't even don't change the look and feel. I have to train my employees how to use it. Everybody's going to go, oh, what is this? I don't get it. Oh no! So they businesses don't they don't care. And I do. I don't know. Do we care? Do consumers care? I don't know. I don't know. Some good news on Thursday, I, in my opinion, anyway, from the Supreme Court. There is a uh, Computer Fraud Act um, that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act from 1986. So you could tell it's kind of it's so old, it's probably a little out of date. CFAA, they call it, which has been used, honestly, to go after people for things that I wouldn't call hacking or fraud. Abuse, maybe. I don't know. For instance, uh, there was one very well-known case, uh, 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 one of the most important uh, young guys on the, uh, on the internet who, was, who had invented some very important things like uh, RSS, without which podcasts would not exist and so forth. Uh, Aaron Schwartz was being prosecuted for what I would say was probably not computer abuse or fraud but, or hacking, but merely kind of... Um, civil disobedience, he was downloading uh, scientific articles, articles, studies that we had paid for as the taxpayers, but were, were behind a paywall. He was downloading them because he had access to that database to uh, make them public, as they should be. And uh, the uh, feds came after him. And, it be and he faced perhaps decades uh, behind bars and uh, and killed himself as a result at the age of 26. A very sad, huge loss to the community. Huge loss. And, uh, you know, he's become a folk hero. And that was under the CFAA. The, he was he was being investigated. A little less sanguine about the case that the Supreme Court decided on. Van Buren involved a former police officer, he was uh, convicted of violating the CFAA because uh, the FBI, as a part of a sting operation, came to him as you know, as a you know, undercover, saying, "Hey, could you search the license plate database for us?" Now, the the officer had access to it legitimately, um, and he did it. They, you know, and, and he was convicted of uh, of violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, for searching that license plate database in exchange for a bribe. He appealed the conviction saying, hey, the CFAA, that all this, this was unauthorized use of a system I'm authorized to use as part of my job, and the Supreme Court agreed and overturned that conviction. Maybe the, you know, maybe this will focus on the bribe part. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm really glad that they overturned this. Um, on the other hand, some people aren't. The National Whistleblower Center <laughs> uh, warned, actually, no, they they were the ones they were among the many briefs in in favor of overturning it. They they wrote a brief, an amicus brief, as they call it, a friend of the court brief to the Supreme Court, saying if you apply the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to any unauthorized use of computer data, as was the case with this officer and with Aaron Schwartz, uh, that would invite retaliation against whistleblowers, right? Because 
they could say, well, you know, he was looking at stuff he shouldn't have been looking at. The uh, Libertarian Americans for Prosperity Foundation. I'm for prosperity. Who isn't? Go prosperity. They said the government's interpretation of the law would cover violations of the fine print in websites' terms of service. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> and wrongly criminalize a wide swath of innocent, innocuous conduct. That, yeah, that's true. So this is good. The Supreme Court very much narrowed uh, how this can be used by federal law enforcement. I think that's a good thing. So that's my opinion anyway. You can call to argue with me. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 8888-ASK-LEO. And we will talk high tech. You and me and the rest of the world in just a little bit. <laughs> Hacking in progress. That's a good, that's a good example of uh, the Computer Fraud Act. <laughs> you guys touching all these computers. <laughs> You're in trouble, buddy. You're in trouble. <laughs> Kim Schaffer. She's relaxed, man. She's laying back. She is doing some telephone love, man. The unbreakable Kimmy Shafa. Hello, Kimmy. I should have worn my dreads today. Yeah, you have dreads? No, what, you you I don't. just put them on? A dread. <laughs> I used to have, I don't know where Dread it went. wig, yeah. If you got a dread wig, I'll, I had I'll borrow one that. of those. <laughs> it, had, it was a Jamaican dread wig. Where is it gone? I'll find it and I'll put it on. Man of many hats. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a, I bought it. I finally, you know, I used to have probably 200 hats in the office right here in the studio. Mm -hmm. And then um, I gave some to Micah, my co host for uh, the, the show we do, because that's, we wore hats for that show. Oh. And then I brought some home because, you know, now I'm a Twitch streamer. <laughs> I stream my game, uh, my, my Valheim game. And uh, I decided, since I'm so boring, if I wore a funny hat, maybe people would find it amusing. Is it working? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I never consider myself funny. At best, I hope for mildly amusing once in a while. You're so, funny. You're really funny. Mild, <laughs> funny looking. So, Kim, hello. You look you look lovely on this oh, summer day. You. Who yeah. should I start with Let's here? go to Frances in Norwalk. She's having problems with her cell phones, all of them. Okay. And Cell phone is crucial for her, so well, or phone phone connect con connection is crucial. You know, for we her. had that call yesterday with the guy having trouble with his uh, Wi-Fi calling on T-Mobile, and so. she brought up the word Costco, and I have the same problem in Costco. She lives near a Costco, so I'm wondering if it's Costco. <laughs> I don't think living near a Costco hurts your cell service, but let's it see. Hurts mine. Let, let's see. If we, let's see what we can do. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Francis Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, I. Sure hope you can give me some ideas. Okay. Um, we have three cell phones, and they're all different makes. They're not the same um, manufacturer. And we're having trouble with call drops or people not being able to hear us on the phone or sending text messages that are never received. Um, we're just having all kinds of problems. And recently, my son's wife, he lives with us, um, had brain surgery, oh, and dear. the surgeon was not able to reach my son oh. head with the surgery, and he wasn't even aware of it. Oh, dear. Uh, so I'm so frustrated. I don't know if it's our location. I don't know if it's the phones. Um, we've traded them in. Uh, we make sure they're always updated. Uh, we're doing everything that we can possibly do, and... At this point, I don't even know what company to go to, even if we... I could even take a loan and pay off the phones if I had to. Yeah. So you're in Norwalk, which is a very pretty area. It's a little rural, though, yes? Uh, not anymore. It's, it's inhabited by a lot of people and a lot of homeless people. and, and um, <laughs> So the, the issue of... Kind of laid back. Yeah. So well, the issue, reason I say rural is the issue is... A cell tower issue, I think. So what carrier are you using? T-Mobile. Okay. And have you tried or do other people come visit you and with other carriers just to see? No, we haven't tried that because of the pandemic. Actually, we don't have too many people over anymore. But we could. Yeah. Uh, I so, just found that so we seem to have more trouble ever since Sprint and T-Mobile got together. Yeah, that could well be. Why. So... so um, 
you'd think it'd be better because they'd have the Sprint towers, but the Sprint towers were using a different technology than T-Mobile's towers. So towers have been merged, towers have been shut down. It, it may just be a temporary thing. You're you're probably right though when you say it started to happen when the the merger happened. Um, it sounds to me, if you're all on T-Mobile, that this is just a weak sell signal. And, uh, you know, if it works better, maybe when you're somewhere else, many small towns, Norwalk is small enough, have one cell tower, and you may be somewhat distant from the cell tower in that town. That, and the problem is the coverage maps don't tell you anything. You know, they're really not very useful. Right. We tried looking at that. Yeah. Yeah, they for us this is like kind of a serious issue, especially yeah. um she's paraplegic, uh and um if what? we have, she's okay to be left alone, but we can't No no, you want it to work. She may not be able to reach us. Yeah. So there are ways that you can you know, enter a secret code <laughs> that will 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 tell you the exact signal strength you're getting the reason i say that and it is probably not going to be that useful but the, the you know i could say well how many bars are you getting you know the little cell phone bars right but that that isn't also very accurate in fact very famously apple at one point was having trouble with the iphone 4s and the antenna and instead of fixing it they just changed the way the bars look so, so that's a that's nice. So, but I, let me ask you: Are you seeing how many bars are you seeing on your phones from the cell signal? Do you know where to look on that? I I, I don't even I I never up at the top. It depends on the phone, but it's always at the top right yeah. corner. There's I, right now. I'm calling you from my landline because well, I'm glad you have a landline. That was going to be my other suggestion. I am it? not going to get rid of yeah, my yeah. landline. Yeah, and that's on that's on uh, the internet. So I have well, most of the time it works. Well, see, that's the other problem, right? The internet. So remember the uh, good old days uh -huh. <laughs> uh, when uh, the good old days when we had third parties on the phone. I'm yeah, you remember party lines? Well, the good, yeah, no, that's when it was really rural. The the good old days when the phone company was you know Ma Bell and it was heavily regulated. Um, they really focused on reliability, um, and Internet telephony is never going to be as good as or reliable as the old-fashioned telephone network, which you can still get, by the way. You know, you might look at getting a phone service from a from your local carrier, not from your uh, cable provider, your internet provider. But that doesn't solve the cell phone thing. I think you need a different uh, carrier. And I, I think so too. Yeah, and I think I, that will solve I, it. The problem is knowing which. Now, one one thing you should know is you can go to a carrier store. Uh, or any cell phone store, and try it for a week before you buy it. You can say, "Look, I don't. I'm getting no signal in my house. I want to try this and see how it works." They may even be able to take that existing phone of yours. These days, most phones work on all the carriers, and so you. It may be that just you know, T-Mobile is just not doing the job. And in fact, I would say that's since they're all T-Mobile phones, that's pretty much it. And it's very local. It really depends where you are. So Verizon might be better, AT&T might be better. It's probably worth a try. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> my, my studio manager, who apparently knows Norwalk well, says there's nothing rural about Norwalk. So I'm sorry, Francis, for implying that. Oh, she's gone. I hope the call didn't drop. It's Norwalk, Connecticut. Not California. Right? Oh, yeah, John. I thought, yeah, Norwalk, Connecticut was... Oh, it was California. Oh, is that in the L.A. area? I thought it was Connecticut. Okay. So it's it's urban, yeah. Hey, Sam. Hey, Leo. It's not, it's, it's not time for you, is it? It is. It is. Mr. Mr. Car Guy, how are you? I'm doing okay. You sure she wasn't from Norwalk, Ohio? Because that is pretty rural. I thought Norwalk, Connecticut the whole time. I didn't know it was Norwalk, California. There, there's a bunch of Norwalks around the country. I guess so. And you're not supposed to walk there. So she's in, only two she's in L.A. It's just, you know what? It's I bet you, is it Hill Country, John, Norwalk, California? Is it in the, is it in the valley? 
Is it a hilly? Because it could, if she's like behind a hill, there's all sorts of things. It could be very local, in other words. And that's, you know. Yeah, my college roommate was from Norwalk, okay. Ohio, and it, it, it was pretty rural. Okay. Norwalk's at the end of the 105, so I guess it's okay. Yeah, as soon as she said homeless people, the Discord folks said, oh, yeah, that's California. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help fix the digital clocks. I'm sorry. They're all different times. That's apparently bugging people. This one's 40, 58, and 41. I can't... Even if I said it, that they would all match, they would drift. So I'm just not going to try. You know what? That's... That's why they say you never have more than one clock. We'll have more of the Tech Guy Show in just a bit, but first a word from our sponsor, the great folks at Casper. I can't wait to try the new Casper Cooling Collection. Just in time for these hot summer nights. Casper and the Cooling Collection has everything you need to help you sleep cool all night long. And winter or summer, we know sleeping cool is the key to a good night's rest. Did you know that? Temperature regulation is everything. Casper's mattresses have this new snow technology. Incredible. Hyperlight sheets. They have lightweight duvets. They even have a breathable mattress protector, all with one idea in mind to keep you cool and comfortable so you can't help but love your tomorrow. I'm in my tomorrow today, and I love it because I slept in a Casper last night. And tomorrow, that's a new day. So make the most of it with Casper's new cooling collection. So first, the Wave Hybrid Snow Mattress. Yeah, I just feel chills talking about it. Keeps you cool 12 plus hours, pulls heat away from your body for sustained temperature regulation, a cool to the touch feeling, and a much improved tomorrow. You know that feeling when you, you flip the pillow over and, it, and it's nice and cool? On the, on the fresh side, or you stick your, your feet down in the covers in a part you haven't been, and it's nice and cool. That's what you want all night long. That's what Casper gives you. Better bedding, too, for a better tomorrow. Casper's Hyper Light Sheets, designed with an innovative grid weave that lets the air flow. Breathability is just as important. Maximum breathability. The lightweight duvet gives you that plush comfort you want from a duvet, but with optimal temperature control. So it's not hot and heavy on top of you. It's not winter. It's summer. Casper's breathable mattress protector improves the coolness of the bed even further by allowing air to flow between your body and mattress. Even in the winter, this is what you want. You want the Casper cooling collection. All of them designed to work together to prevent overheating all night long because cooler sleep means better sleep and better sleep means better tomorrows. I know people who sleep out on their balcony during the hot summer months don't need to. You got a Casper. You're golden. You're good. You're cool, you're calm, you're collected. Uh, and everybody in my family, by the way, has a Casper. Abby's just in the other room. I should ask her. She got I, I set her up when she moved to her new apartment with the Casper frame, the Casper foundation, the Casper mattress, the Casper sheets, the Casper pillows. She's all Casper, all Casper. As always, Casper offers free shipping and free returns. That was a big deal for me. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to go to the mattress store or anything like that. You know, they don't have one. You just... Order them online. I know I'm going to get a great mattress. Had it shipped to Abby. It was, it was a nice housewarming gift. She was very happy and very affordable, too. When it comes to a better night's sleep, Casper's new cooling collection has you covered. Focus on tomorrow. Let Casper handle the rest. Explore Casper products, mattresses, sheets, pillows, and more at casper.com slash twit1 and use the code twit1 for $100 off select mattresses. Nice, yeah? Offer code again, twit and the number one, $100 off select mattresses. Exclusions apply. See casper.com for more details. casper.com slash twit1. We thank him so much for supporting the tech guy. Thank you for supporting the tech guy by using that address and that offer code. That way they know you saw it here. casper.com slash twit1. Offer code, what is it? Right, twit1. Thanks, Casper. It's time for car guy Sam Abul Samad, principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. He's at wheelbearings.media. we got a big NASCAR race starting up uh, down the road a piece in just a little bit at Infineon. So traffic is tough around here. But Sam, he drove in in his magic helicopter. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Hi, Leo. How are you today? Good to see you. What is that you're sitting in front of? It looks like a Lexus. 
That is the uh, the Lexus LS 500H, uh, the 2022 model, a which hybrid. will be coming out this fall. A hybrid. Uh, it is it is a hybrid. There's there's already a hybrid, but this the it's getting an update for 2022, mm -hmm. um, and they will be adding a feature called Lexus Teammate, um, which they're also adding to. Uh, the Toyota Mirai in Japan. It's not coming to the Mirai here yet, but it is in Japan. And this is Toyota's first uh, hands-free driver assist oh, system. Oh, boy. Um, here we like go. Like Super Cruise yeah, and yeah. Ford Blue Cruise and, and some others. Uh, but what I, you know, and, and there's you know, a lot of neat features that are going to be part of this. Um, and one of the things that's going to be on the, the Lexus is it's going to be uh, Toyota's first implementation of LiDAR on a production vehicle. Wow. So now, now uh, isn't Elon taking lidar out? He, he's never had lidar in. Oh. They're, they're taking radar. Radar. Off. Okay. So yes. there's so there's three ways you can your car can tell what's going on out there. There's cameras, obviously. Most cars these days have cameras. Mm -hmm. There's radar, which is Elon the only. Are Teslas the only cars that you used radar? No, everybody uses. Everybody radar. uses radar. <laughs> And then but, there's lidar, which is a 3D radar like, but it's using lasers, 3D imaging yes. technology. And yeah, it's there's, the most there's expensive. Some, yeah, well, um, it, it has been. There are some new lidar sensors coming to market uh, that are going to be. They're significantly less expensive. They're getting down into the low hundreds of dollars. Oh, that is and cheaper. They, yeah, they used to be thousands, so, tens of thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Toyota. Um, it hasn't said exactly which LiDAR sensor they're using, although there's been some reports that it's a new flash LiDAR unit from Continental, a uh, German supplier. Uh, and those might be as low as 100 to $150. But this is uh, the debate unit. is, you know, what do you need for a self-driving vehicle? Elon says, oh, you just need cameras. He's uh, wrong. Yeah, I think he's probably wrong. Well, <laughs> well I mean, the, the, the reason, reason why I say he's wrong um, is... That for for self driving, um, you actually need multiple types of sensors because a, a vehicle that is really highly automated needs to have what we call fail operational capability. So it's got if something goes wrong, if you detect a fault with one system, right? Uh, because there's a possibility there may not be anybody in the vehicle. The system has to have redundancy and diversity to make sure that there's a backup system that can take over and continue driving the vehicle at least until it gets to a safe location. Uh, with with traditional driver assist systems, you can you don't need you can get by without the redundancy uh, from a safety perspective because all, what you have to be able to do is detect the fault and then alert the driver and the driver is the backup system. But uh, if you're going to go fully autonomous, you don't you may not have a driver. And so you have to have a, a system that can take over that control. Plus, the other thing, too, is, you know, for automated systems, you, what you really want also is uh, some active sensors, not just passive sensors. Cameras are passive sensors, so they don't send out a signal. They're just recording what's coming in, the, the visible light signal that's coming in and then processing that. But um, the, and the problem with that is it's very difficult uh, especially to measure distance, uh, especially the way that Tesla has their cameras configured. You can do it. Um, you can record, um, you can measure distance uh, if you're using a stereo or a multi-camera setup where the cameras are separated and you get the parallax, just like your eyes. You know, you, you get depth perception because your eyes are separated. Um, on Teslas, the cameras are all clustered together. There's three cameras, a, a telephoto, a wide angle, and an ultra wide. Um, to give you different fields of view, but you don't really get any parallax effect from that. So what you need is cameras that are separated. Uh, but then ideally, you also want some active sensors because cameras, you know, obviously are limited by visible light. If it's dark out or if it's foggy, you know, you, you can't see so much with cameras. And so um, LiDAR, you know, uses a laser to uh, to basically paint the scene with light uh, in the infrared spectrum, and then the sensor picks that up. Radar uses radio waves to do the same thing. And so ideally, you want to have um, multiple types of sensors so that under, you know, regardless of what the conditions are, because each one has different strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so, uh, you know, having a, an active sensor like radar or LIDAR, even for a driver assist system, is really important to get accurate distance measurements. Up to now, uh, LIDAR, they've both been more expensive than cameras. So, so 
you know. Yeah, radar radar is actually pretty inexpensive. The, at least the you know the most of the radars that have been used on most vehicles are pretty inexpensive. Hmm. They're about uh, thirty five to forty dollars okay. for automotive radar. Okay, and cameras are about ten dollars or less. Uh, so lidar but, is, an, is another order of magnitude more expensive, though, and it used to be lots it, it is. more expensive. Yeah, and there are still lidars that cost thousands of dollars. You know, for for do, high performance do, lidar. Is is lidar better? Uh, I I understand it's different. <laughs> it's it's better it's better in that you can very accurately measure distance, yeah, um, yeah. much more so than you can with a camera setup. Yeah, like our um, iPhones and iPads now have lidar for focusing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's not. You don't have as much resolution as you do with a camera, uh, but you have more resolution than you do with a radar. Radar is also very good for measuring distance and speed, but uh, you don't have the um, uh, you don't have as much resolution with most radar sensors. And that's you know that's the problem you know with the the inexpensive radar sensors. You know they they have very low resolution. Uh, they're very good at measuring distance to something like that's straight in front of you, but not so much for um, you know, for being able to detect what it is you're seeing. It, it can tell you there's something, you know, 100 meters away from you, but it can't tell you what it is. Um, cameras can do that. LiDAR can do some of that, depending on how high the resolution of the LiDAR is. But radar is also really good at seeing through things like fog and snow and rain, where cameras, and to a lesser degree, LiDAR can struggle sometimes. Yeah, you wouldn't want to say, oh, you can uh, use self-driving, but not if it's raining. <laughs> that would be kind right. of bad. Yeah. 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 But, but the thing I really wanted to, to talk about today, actually, was the use of GPUs in cars. Graphics um, processing the, units. You mean like the NVIDIA and Radeon cards in our computers? Yep. The um, the um, the Toyota's uh, the Toyota Teammate system has um, a GPU in there, which they haven't said what it is, but it's believed to be uh, an NVIDIA uh, GPU. Mm. And the update for the Tesla Model S and X that they announced a few months ago um, with the refreshed interior and the, the stupid yoke steering wheel. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things they put in there, the, the current generation uh, Model S and X use uh, Intel CPUs to drive their infotainment screen, um, but they are switching to AMD, to an AMD uh, APU, which uh, includes um, a Ryzen CPU and a Radeon GPU. Uh, so basically what they've got in there is pretty close to the same chip that's in the new Sony PS5, powering the infotainment. Yeah, he in said you'd be able to play AAA video games. Yeah. Uh, that, I don't know. That's just, that's Elon and marketing as far as I'm concerned. I can't, there's no, is there a good reason? You're not, the car's not using it, right? Just the driver. Uh, no. Just the yeah, passengers. Just the, just the driver. Yeah, let's yeah. hope not so the when, driver. So when you're, when you're parked somewhere, you can watch a movie and, and you know, You don't HD need it to watch a movie. Depth. You need it to play, play video games. games. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can play. Uh, Elon um, likes video yeah. games, so I guess it's really for yeah. him. You can you can play Crisis on it or uh, yeah, that's crazy. Um, you know, cy uh, <laughs> I got a PlayStation Five in my car. Yeah, that's, yeah you can play I guess it's, in your it car. sells the car. It sells the car. Yeah, Sam Abul Samet, principal researcher, Guidehouse Insights. He uh, is a podcaster. If you love cars, you'll love his Wheel Bearings podcast at Wheelbearings Media with the great Roberto Baldwin, who will be joining us this week on our uh, News Roundtable show, Twits. So it's it's all kind of part of the family. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sam. We'll see you next week. Leo Laporte. See you next week, Leo. The Tech Guy. Or you could mine Bitcoin with your car, with your Tesla. Yeah, to Dogecoin. Toyota's actually using... Toyota is actually using the GPU for the uh, the hands-free driver assist system, not for the infotainment. Yeah, that, so, makes, that I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and there's actually uh, a number of vehicles that uh, there's some there's several vehicles in Japan in China now that have Nvidia Xavier chips in there, and there's more coming uh, later this year and next year uh, with Nvidia chips neat. driving the uh, driver assist systems. That's really neat. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, you'd still want to stick around, right? Yeah, I can do that. All yours, my friend. All right. Answer the questions from the chat or whatever you want to do, or just sing a song. You could tap dance. I don't care. <laughs> oh, you, you definitely don't want to hear me sing a song. That would that would not be good. Not if you want to keep your listeners. Uh, but uh, let's see. Uh, so Lawn Dog uh, says, 
Uh, I'm not so convinced the graphics chips are being used to run displays. It seems like 10 times overkill. How about using the computational power of the GPU for navigation stuff and sensors to read the road? Um, so yeah, that is that is what Toyota is doing. You know, I mean, actually, cars have been using GPUs, older generation GPUs, for a while to power infotainment. Um, the 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 Model S, when it first launched in 2012, was running uh, an NVIDIA uh, Tegra um, chip in there, an SOC, which is an, uh, an ARM chip with one of their older generation GPUs in there. Um, and uh, there's a number of vehicles that are using those chips uh, to, to power you know, the, the displays. Um, from uh, KM6JBI, who has the best driver assist? You know, it depends on what your definition of best is. I think of the systems that are in the market right now, I would say the uh, GM's Super Cruise system is the the most reliable and the, the most predictable and robust. It doesn't necessarily have as much functionality as, say, what Autopilot claims to do, but it does it much more consistently and you can you can count on it and it has a, a proper driver monitor system. Um, Tech Dino uh, went uh, BMW. They use materials you can see through for windows instead of steel. <laughs> yeah, that's always a good thing. You definitely, as long as you still have to drive, you definitely want to be able to see out of your vehicle. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, out there. Um, you know, as I said, more more and more companies are using GPUs, um, and next year. Uh, we'll have the first cars coming to market um, from Volvo and from a couple of Chinese manufacturers that are using NVIDIA's new Orin uh, SOC, which is based on, uh, it's got, uh, I think, eight ARM CPU cores and a GPU based on their Ampere uh, chipset, uh, their Ar Ar Ampere um, GPU architecture, which is what is used in the uh, 20 and 30 series, the RTX 2080 and 3080 uh, series chips uh, or video cards. So you'll have that in there. And that's being used, again, to drive primarily to drive driver assistance systems, but it's also used for uh, some of the infotainment and other things. Um, have I, Maverick 56, have I reviewed the Polestar yet? Uh, no, I have not had a chance. There hasn't been one in the, the local press fleet yet. So I ha hopefully I'll get into one soon. Um, but I would like to, I'm definitely looking forward to trying that one out. Um, everybody I've talked to that's driven it, uh, has been quite impressed with it. Uh, it's also got one of the first, uh, Android automotive infotainment systems and it includes, uh, um, Google Assistant built in as well as oh, uh, the Google nice. Play Store. Hey, is there an electric uh, Lexus yet? All electric? Uh, next year. Next First year. one's coming next year. Yeah. And will it be a luxury vehicle? Or it'll be like Oh, yeah. If it's a, Lexus, it's always going to be a but luxury. It'll be like the, the SUV, probably. Uh, I probably, really yeah, loved they, my Lexus. I miss my Lexus. I would buy an Lexus. Yeah, they showed a, they showed a concept uh, in April at the Shanghai show uh, called the LFZ, and that's going to be the basis for it. Stick around for the top of the hour? Thank you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Um, it was Norwalk, California, by the way. I thought it was Norwalk, Connecticut. That's why I asked her if it's rural. I know Norwalk, California is not rural. So, it, it, But it, it, we were talking uh, before uh, Sam at the bottom of the hour uh, with a caller who's just all of her cell phones are unreliable. The texts don't go through. Calls sometimes don't go through. Uh, calls drop. That's a bad cell phone signal. It is the case that different phones have different, um, I would say, have different capabilities with regard to uh, their antennas. You know, the days when, remember the early days of cell phones, you'd have a extensible antenna, you'd pull it out, and, you you know, those were much better for signal, signal quality. The other thing that was better was at the time we were on an analog system, not a digital system. So instead of calls just dropping, you'll probably remember when we first switched over to digital because all of a sudden you just the call would stop. You'd just drop when you if you're driving down the road and you the cell handoff didn't work or something like that, it just dropped. With analog it would degrade, you know, get worse and worse. I don't think anybody remembers what that was like, but that was in the old days. So times have changed. We have digital now, we had we don't, you know, it's not that the phones don't need an antenna. They still need an extensible antenna. 
But the companies realized nobody wanted those. They broke all the time. So they built the antenna into the phone, and there are all sorts of problems with it. That iPhone 4S that had a problem that we were talking about, uh, uh, it, you may remember the antenna gate with the iPhone. If you held the phone just so, it, it, you could watch the signal bars disappear bit by bit because you were covering up the, uh, the antenna. And it was just kind of the natural way to hold the phone. Although Steve Jobs very famously, his first response to this, well, you're holding it wrong. <laughs> Not a good response, Steve. Uh, and Apple's response ultimately was to offer everybody who owned an iPhone 4S a rubber baby buggy bumper to put around it. <laughs> Which did, in fact, fix it because the rubber meant that your hand couldn't impede the antenna as much, and so the signal didn't disappear. All of which is to say that cell phones' antennas are not very good these days. Uh, and so, you know, it, she did mention she has multiple different phones, so I'm going to assume it's T-Mobile, but it could be that she's getting cell phones that don't have great antennas. You know, unfortunately, I don't think anybody really tests how good the antennas are. It's a, it's a very hard thing to do because... The signal you're getting varies very much depending on where you are. You'd have to have a, a special, build a special rig with an antenna in the building at a at the exactly the right distance to measure the antennas. And I'm maybe somebody does, but I, I have not seen those antenna measurements. It's probably too costly and time consuming. And there's too many phones, so maybe getting a different phone would help. But probably getting a different carrier would fix it. And you want to get the carrier that has the best results in your area. Ask your neighbors, ask your friends. Uh, as I said, most cell care companies will let you kind of try before you buy, or you just buy it, but you'll have a seven to fourteen day window that you can return it. Um, that's probably the only way to really be sure it's going to work well at home. And then look at those bars at the top of the phone, up, the, up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, you should be getting four bars. I don't. Can you get five? Depends on the phone. I guess you can. On some phones, I'm just looking now. Some phones you can have. Um, some phones are just a triangle. <laughs> uh, on the iPhone, it's four bars. If you're getting one bar or no bars, yeah, that's no signal. That's no signal. There is one more thing you can do, and uh, we actually do it here in the studio. And if you call T-Mobile and say, "I'm going to leave you." I'm breaking up with you. They will give you something uh, called a femto cell. That's the generic term that each company has its own whizzy name for it. But the idea is it's a little cell tower that you put in your house that connects to your internet. And it doesn't save you uh, money because you're still getting charged by the minute by the cell phone company. But it does give you a much stronger signal. And T-Mobile makes them and sells them. I bet you if you say, I'm leaving you, they'll give it to you for free. They do, they do, normally they sell it to you. The other negative on that is it does rely on internet access. And it sounds like her internet access was kind of not great either. In fact, that might be what's really going on is that her phone is switching to Wi Fi calling and it's not working very well. So there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems. There's Wi Fi calling, which may or may not work well, a femto cell, which is cell calling using your internet. <laughs> And then maybe the towers themselves are not very good. It's a complicated thing, isn't it? Uh, Jim is on the line from Winnetka, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Jim. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm good. I'm hoping you can give me uh, some guidance. I'm looking for um, uh, like a microphone that you can wear either on your chest, nothing really big, that would broadcast what's like in the room for people who are hard of hearing. Ah. And then would... With, but then pump it up to through Bluetooth to bone conducting headphones. So um, Apple actually has started offering something in the iPhone that does that. If you have hearing aids, and I use this, you can have your iPhone's microphone be the input to the hearing aids, which means you could put it in the middle of a table with a lot of people talking, or if you're at a lecture, you could put it up on the lectern, and your hearing aids will get a much better signal. So that is rapidly becoming part of the hearing aid world. Now, you're saying you don't want to use hearing aids, you want to use headphones? Right, because the hearing aids work your, use your eardrums to hear. And that's the reason you can't hear is because your eardrums are bad. But if you use, like, uh, the headphones I'm, we're speaking with right now, I'm, I have on, 
are aftershock aeroplanes. They're it's a bone conducting. Yeah, I have aftershocks. I uh, I like aftershocks. So I those like so those work with people with with uh, uh, eardrum damage. Yes, my mom. I gave her one. I I set it up for her TV because my daughter said or my sister said when she goes in there, she says four houses down, I can hear mom's TV running. <laughs> and I said, well, here, let's try this. And my mom said the the bone phones. Headphones are great. Oh, interesting. She says she can hear it because then it's actually connecting on the inside of your head, basically. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> but I haven't found a microphone that actually that doesn't have any kind of a lag in it. Yeah, Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth is an inherent lag, and that's part of the problem is it's Bluetooth. Um, that's why the hearing aid companies that do this, and by the way, uh, Phonak makes a special, just exactly as you described, microphone that uh, you can clip on your, your pocket or you could put next to the TV. Um, uh, my headphone, my uh, hearing aids have a similar device that I can put on the TV. So this is not unusual. Uh, the Roger uh, can be used as a pen. It actually looks like a pen. Um, now, they also can be used with cochlear implants and hearing aids, but the, the difference is they're not using Bluetooth. They're using RF, their they're, uh, FM wireless technology. And that's why there's no lag and i bet you that's why they don't use bluetooth on these so you would yeah. like to she wants to use the aftershocks for this yeah i have her i bought her a pair of aftershocks she loves that one i bought another pair it's going to be really hard the problem with aftershocks is it connects to the tv through a, a little box that we set up for there and if i get this microphone it's going to connect to that but blue but the aftershock doesn't really do two things at one time they only like to listen to one thing. Yeah. So it's really hard. This for is an issue with this is all Bluetooth. All of these problems are Bluetooth related. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the problem. So, yes, there are absolutely uh, a variety of wireless uh, microphones. I don't know if any of them use Bluetooth for this very reason. Let me just see if I can uh, find Every, one. Everything that I looked at that I could find seemed like it was more like for bloggers you know, and bloggers. That, that yeah, like, and it usually has speaking. its own receiver, and it's using yeah. FM radio uh, or something like it to do the wireless transmission, and that's because there is inherent in Bluetooth considerable lag. So um, I I don't see any. I'm looking at to see if I can find any Bluetooth microphones. The only ones I see are karaoke microphones. <laughs> that's not going to do it. <laughs> that's not going to do it. Uh, although I guess you could try it. She'd, she'd have to carry it around in her hand. <laughs> uh, I was trying to get away from yeah, having yeah. To do the, the microphone. Uh, thing. Here's one from Sabine Tech. I'm looking on Amazon. It's the Smart Mic Plus Wireless Lavalier, by the way, is the term you want to know. That's the lapel mics. They're called lavaliers, L-A-V-A-L-I-E-R. Right. So this is a yeah, wireless a Bluetooth lavalier. Um, I, I guess they intend it for, yeah, see, this is going to be a problem. This is, this is the wrong kind of Bluetooth. This is to connect to a phone, uh, which means it is yeah, seen as a headset device, different. not as what you want, which is a Bluetooth input to right. headphones you basically want something that is not a mic doesn't look like a microphone to the headphones looks like a us a, a, a bluetooth transmitter like you know phone um the right. phone would do it by the way i gotta take a break leo yeah. laporte the tech guy um let me think about this i you know i don't Anything that can transmit to a phone would work. I mean, anything that acts like a phone would work. Because the that's what the that's what the aftershocks or any headphones are going to look for is a Bluetooth transmitter. They're Bluetooth headphones. So uh, right, she still likes her flip phone, which is yeah. I can't so you can use oh yeah, because because you can use an iPhone that way. You can you could put an iPhone and I can't remember the name of the, of the the mode that they call it, but you can put an iPhone in a mode that will be a microphone transmitting to the headphones. Um, this is a really interesting question. Yeah, the microphones I see are designed to to uh, send a recorder. Yeah, send a send a recorder or this this one Bluetooth microphone. Let me look here. Sabine Tech official smart mic plus 
It's really used for phone calls. So the idea is it's a phone call, but see, that's not going to help her. The aftershocks have a microphone in them. Uh, what I gave my mom yeah. is basically is is wireless headphones. I think this is a much better way to do it than the. But she, you say she needs the aftershocks. Well, the aftershocks is the set I bought. I, that's what I bought her for the. But key. she needs bone and conductance, not a no lag on that. Yeah. It, it's perfect with the TV and sync and everything. I bought this other set so she would have two different Bluetooth, so she wouldn't have to try to sync it to each one. But since I can hear when I put them on, I can hear my voice and I can hear other people in the room, and there's like a one second delay, and then it comes through really clear on my on the headphones, and it's like, yeah, that's she's deaf, so my mom might. Eh, my the lip sync would be terrible for TV. So what? So she is. She has something she's using now with the aftershocks, and the TV. Yeah. What is that? Right. Oh God! Well, I wish I could remember what I bought her. So, uh, it was something I bought off of Amazon, and it actually came with five different ways to connect it. Whether it connects the TV, and it has no, uh, it has no lag, huh? No lag. It's perfect. And she even called me up afterwards and said, "I really like this. Can you set this up for other people and in, in where she lives at?" <laughs> well, no, I can't. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to go into business doing this. So there are a lot of wireless TV headphones, but the problem is they're all traditional headphones, and she doesn't want that. She needs a bone <laughs> conductance headphone. The, the bone conduction works really well, and the, the other nice thing about the way that it's set up right now is she can control the volume for her headset. Why everybody else in the room is still listening to the TV at the regular uh, level? Yeah, right. Because a lot of times when you have a, a, a headset, it turns off the, the sound on the, the TV. So I was like, okay, well, I bought her this thing just like when she goes out. To so what you really want, and uh, I'm I'm looking. There is a there is a a product. It comes with headphones, but it supports Aptex, which is a good high quality Bluetooth. It's from Avantre, A-V-A-N-T-R-E-E. -E. It comes with a transmitter, which hooks up to your TV, and I bet you that would pair to the Aftershocks because it's using standard Bluetooth. Um, work when you yeah. use it with the other Bluetooth receiver. Oh, yeah, it would work with other... It works with other things. And because it's Aptex, it's going to be better results. That may be what you got that, that worked. Now, it comes with a pair of over-the-ear headphones, which she's not going to want. This is similar to what I got. I got my mom a set pair of Sennheiser headphones for the same. But they use RF. A lot of these use RF. This is the first ones I've found that use Bluetooth. It uses Aptex. I don't know. You should check first to see if the um, Aftershocks support Aptex, which is a high-quality Bluetooth profile for stereo. A A P T X. If it does, this Avantri would give you probably the best results. Okay. Uh, the A I'll put a link in the show notes and in the chat room. It's the A V. You can look at it on Amazon. A V A N T R E E. Avantri, which is just some Chinese company, of course. H T five thousand nine. But it says it will work with non with other headphones besides its own. So that's what you really you're buying is this Aptex transmitter. That's what you really care about. Yeah, that's it. That's all I care about the, yeah. the transmitter and like yeah. Said. And there may be we have some other links. It looks like in the chat room for other uh, devices that might might do this. Um, okay. The Givet G I V E E T Bluetooth transmitter is another one. But they uh, oh that's interesting. That plugs right into the TV. That's this is a lot cheaper. Twenty six bucks. GIV That's probably like the one that I got. Yeah, it plugs into the TV, it into the TV. and it's a transmitter and it supports Aptex. So, uh, you could pair up to two headphones to it. So that's probably what you want. It's on Amazon. GIV -E -E Bluetooth 5 transmitter receiver. At least it's cheap. Okay. I'll have to get I'll one of these and try it out. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to buy it and try it out. Hey, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye. Sorry, Sam. All yours. Let me uh, let me put Sam back in the... There you are. Now, you're muted right now. Are you talking? 
Yeah, okay. I, I unmuted my I muted myself just to be on the safe side. All yours, my friend. Um, Sorry about that. All right, thanks. Yeah, so um, one of the things that came up in the the chat earlier was uh, around the question of keeping sensors clean. Um, you know, if you get um, you know snow or ice or bugs or anything else, and I think I think we might have talked about this on a previous segment. But you know, this is one of the challenges that companies building automated driving systems face is keeping the sensors clean because if the if the sensors can't see the world around the vehicle they can't drive the car just like you know if, if you're driving along and you're in a snowstorm uh, if you don't or even in rain and you don't put on your windshield wipers you can't really drive because you can't see and so companies developing these automated driving systems are designing uh, systems to both uh, clean the sensors and also to minimize the need for cleaning sensors. One of the, the interesting devices that um, uh, Ford came up with was basically a little air curtain system that blows uh, a essentially a breeze of air across in front of their sensors uh, that helps to deflect anything that might hit the sensors, like bugs, insects, um, which can be a real problem in certain areas, certain times of the year. And um, it, you know, it minimizes the impact on the, the lenses. And then when, when they do impact, um, they have sprayers. And there's companies, um, there's one company called Siva Technologies has developed a, a heated sprayer system because when you heat up the washer fluid, it actually makes it more effective and helps to clean it off. And you know, if, you, if you live in northern climes, you know, you'll know that uh, – you know, just using windshield wipers is often not enough. You know, especially with salt and uh, ice buildup. But but even you know in in other climates, uh, you know, just trying to get rid of dust or insects, insects and, and bird poop are a real issue. Uh, so keeping the sensors clean is crucial to a functioning um, dr uh, driver assist or um, an automated driving system. I know there have been lots of times when I've been driving in bad weather where I've gotten an alert come up on the screen saying, you know, adaptive cruise control can't work um, or, you know, lane keeping assist can't work because the, the cameras or the radar were covered with too much snow and slush uh, to, to be able to see through. Um, let's see what else. Uh, somebody, um, somebody here asked about the, uh, the Ford Maverick that's going to be unveiled on Tuesday. Unfortunately, I know all about the Maverick, but I cannot talk about it um, until uh, after 6 a.m. on Tuesday, uh, 6 a.m. Eastern time on Tuesday. So you'll just have to tune in uh, late after that to the uh, episode 199 of Wheel Bearings, which that we recorded this morning where we talk all about it. And there's a lot of interesting things about that little truck. I think, uh, I think a lot of people will be really interested in this thing. Thank you, Sam. Have a great day. You too, Leo. I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today, Leo Laporte, the tech guy? Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, hearing aids, smart cars, batteries, all sorts of stuff. Anything with a chip in it, any kind of technology. Let's talk about it. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. If you're outside that area, Skype works should be able to call us, no charge, 8888-ASK-LEO. Website, techguylabs.com. I'm going to put some links there to a variety of devices. We finally found one. The chat, chat room finally found one for our uh, last caller. Interesting conundrum. Uh, for a lot of us who are a little hard of hearing, uh, you know, that can make it problematic for the rest of the people in the house or the neighborhood with the town, because we turn the TV up really loud so we can hear what's going on. Um, there are devices that will allow you to listen to the TV a little bit better. If you wear hearing aids, there are devices you can connect to the TV uh, that will uh, connect to your hearing aids so you can hear it better that way. The problem with hearing aids is they're really just designed for voice. They don't do very well with music, the full range, the full spectrum of audio. So uh, I gave my mom a pair of wireless TV headphones. Sennheiser makes them. Lots of companies do. You plug it in. Uh, one end plugs into the TV. It's got a wireless transmitter. The headphones are wireless. She puts them on, and it works great. And she can turn it up as loud as she wants, and nobody's the wiser. In fact, uh, that works so well that Roku has started to build that into their remote controls. Actually, this is a very clever way of doing it. You can plug in headphones in. They have a headphone jack on some of the Roku remotes. You plug it in, and now you can hear the TV sound 
through your headphones and you can, it doesn't have to go through the room. It's great for late night viewing, things like that. Uh, but all, in almost all these cases, they use radio frequency, not Bluetooth. They use basically FM transmitters uh, because there's a problem with Bluetooth. It, it, it compresses the sound and that process uh, means there's a little bit of delay. And we're very well tuned, the humans, we humans, to uh, lip sync problems. And I, you probably notice this, you know, if you're watching sometimes in the old days of satellite TV, there'd be lip sync issues. Um, if, you know, the lip sync gets out of the movie theater and or you're watching a bad Japanese movie and the dubbing isn't very good. It's just dis disconcerting to see the lips move and the sounds come out later. And that's a problem. Um, with Bluetooth, which is why very few of these companies use Bluetooth. I see there are some companies offering Bluetooth and, uh, you know, like this Givit we mentioned, G-I-V-E-E-T -E that we found, uh, the chat room found on Amazon. My guess is that the newer Bluetooth codecs, this Givit, <laughs> most of these, almost all these companies are Chinese. And Either they try to find a, a, a kind of a romanized name that sounds a little bit like their Chinese name, or they just pick a, something out of a hat. Because the names of some of these companies on Amazon are just bizarre. G-I-V-E-E-T, give it, or give it, give it, give it, I don't know, give it. <laughs> this thing is just a transmitter, but it uses Bluetooth 5, the latest Bluetooth, and it supports Aptex Low Latency. LL slash FS, and they say that's 40 milliseconds of delay. And now that you could probably tolerate. You might notice a little bit. If it's more than, say, half a second, 500 milliseconds, you're going to definitely notice it. 40 milliseconds, I think that's fine. So this is specifically designed to solve this problem. So thank you, chat room, for finding this. It says in the description, no lip sync delay, built-in Aptex low latency codec, LL, Aptex LL, offers just the slightest delay. So, you know, that's a, good, that's a good thing. This is something new. It's good for watching TV. You plug this into the TV, it has a, you know, mini uh, headphone jack or RCA, dual RCA. So you need some sort of analog input. And then it, uh, it can, you can pair it to up to two pairs of headphones. So, and it's 27 bucks. So this sounds like the answer to that question. The answer is Gavit. <laughs> Win, and by the way, their slogan is, Win by quality, Gavit, service with heart. So I think that also has uh, suffered a little bit in uh, translation. But it looks like it's exactly, exactly uh, what you want. And if you look, uh, Amazon, of course, has, you know, people who bought this bought that, and has some others that are similar. So... Uh, you, you know, there's one that has more of a readout. That's from Toxel. <laughs> it's got a little little LED readout on the top. It's also Aptex LL. So that's the really the key is what you're looking for. Aptex LL, low latency. I didn't know that existed, but I do now. Thank you, chat room. Thank you for the call. And now to Michael in Cleveland, Ohio. Hello, Michael. Well, how are you, Leo? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing extremely well. It's a beautiful day here, 90 and sunny. Oh, how beautiful. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, and the lake is beautiful. The river is flowing. It's just a gorgeous day in Cleveland. Yes, it is. I'll be running in the park right nice. by the river. By nice. The river. Very pretty. Well, what can I do for you today? Well, I have kind of an interesting situation. Um, you had a guest on a year or two ago. And I made a note of it, and I put that note in a safe place. And that, as <laughs> Which we know, is the means you can't again. find it ever again. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's safe. Love the safe place. place. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question is, do you recall having a guest on who talked about the fact that he was working on a government program to update the old mainframe computers from the 70s and 80s that were running COBOL? Because this is a rather huge problem for the government. I mean, the Internal Revenue Service, Social Security, all that's running on you know, old computers 
running COBOL. So I have to imagine they're getting reamed on any kind of maintenance. Yeah. No kidding. You know, I'm going to guess, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure this was a guy named Matt Cutts, who was at the time the administrator of a government agency called the USDS, the United States Digital Service. Does that ring a bell? Does that sound right? That might be. What's his, how do you spell his last name? Well, he's not there anymore. He just recently uh, left uh, after the new president came in. You know, there's kind of traditional passing of the torch oh. and so forth. But the U.S. Digital Service is an interesting story. They uh, they started, You do you remember when uh, when um, Obamacare first started up, the, the, the computer uh, sites, the websites for sign-up were so awful, this is back in 2014, that they just didn't work. They had, unfortunately, and this is the normal government procurement system they'd gone out to government contractors and they got a contractor who overcharged them divvied it out and did a terrible job so matt who was yeah, at google was crashed right yeah they crashed everything broke it was it was a mess so matt worked at google at the time he's one of the early googlers and uh he and a lot of other people from silicon valley said this is ridiculous why did you go to that company to do it they don't know what they're doing and then we can help so they got a uh, uh, big companies like google Apple, Microsoft, and others to, to lend out engineers to fix the problem. And uh, uh, they first they fixed healthcare.gov, then they did veterans benefits, then the immigration servers. Uh, it was really pretty impressive. The United States Digital Service was formed. Now, it exists today. It's funded. It's part of the Department of Defense. And if you are interested in what they offer, it's usds.gov. Are you looking for a, a COBOL programmer yourself, or are you a COBOL programmer looking for a gig? Oh, no, I'm a COBOL programmer looking for a gig. Okay. Possibly. So usds.gov slash apply. It is a paying job. It's a, They operate on a kind of a military model, tour of service model. Your term is never more than four years. That's why Matt left. Uh, most people serve for one or two years. You do get paid, but it's it's also government service, and you have to pass a background test and a background check and a drug test and all that. But if you're interested, usds.gov slash apply. I'm pretty sure that was Matt Cutts talking. Uh, and, you know, they need people who can do all sorts of stuff because, they're, as you might imagine, a lot of the uh, government systems are either don't exist or are out of date and need to be updated. And that's kind of important. I kind mean, of important. I would feel good about doing that. Well, that's exactly, I think that's really what brought Matt to it. You know, of course, he's going to make more money at at, uh, at Google. Um, but uh, he really wanted to do some public service. I do see it. One of the things USDS is working on is modernizing the medical, the Medicare uh, payment system, which is 8 million lines of COBOL. 8 million lines of COBOL, 2.5 million lines of assembly running on 15 mainframes. 4.5% of the entire American economy is fueled by Medicare payments. 53 million people rely on it for health care. Soon, I'm soon to be one of them. And it's in COBOL. So that's one of the things they're working on. I bet you they'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Isn't that neat? Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Matt said, if it wasn't the Matt, Said originally he planned to do a one year gig. Yeah, that's exact. That's Matt. Two or <laughs> yeah. more years. Yeah, that's Matt. And he's just left. In fact, we're going to get him on one of our shows now that he's gone. I love Matt. We always used to have him on uh, our This Week in Google show uh, when he was at Google. He did their uh, wonderful webmaster videos. He was beloved at Google. Uh, oh. took, a, took a leave of absence and then um, eventually left to work at USDS and it was. At first, the acting administrator after the administrator left and then became the full-time administrator. And he's just left because of his tour has ended. But, uh, yeah, I think I think this is pretty – I'm pretty sure that's who you're thinking of. And it's – you know, if you want to do some public service using those skills, uh, this would be great. Now, the chat room is telling me there's also a website <laughs> you might want to look up called Cobol Cowboys at CobalCowboys.com. Okay. And and this is uh, this is not governmental. This is a, a company that is brings COBOL programmers together with companies that are desperate. 
<laughs> uh, so you might want to look at Cobalt Cowboys as well. <laughs> hey, it's nice to talk to you. That's great, Michael, that you want to help out. Yeah. Was Matt like over 50? No, um, I think Matt was in his 40s, I would guess. He was not a Cobalt guy. He was, no, like yeah, he... that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, no, he was not a Cobalt guy. He was a, a Google, original Google guy. So that was probably C++ or something like it. But, you know, uh, we need we need Cobalt guys. We need them. Yeah. Cobalt, which is one of the it's oldest languages in the world, is the original business language. In fact, I think that's what it stands for is, uh, yeah, common business oriented language. Um, okay. Not widely used anymore, but but so you're of a certain age, obviously. Well, I didn't learn it originally. Oh, interesting. I knew of it, but I did not learn it back then. But you day. know it now, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I know an even older language. My, my favorite language to work in is Lisp, which is even older than COBOL. Yeah. <laughs> I never even heard of it. Oh, Lisp is wonderful. Don't get me started. Hey, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for joining me, you Michael. Too, I appreciate it. Have a All great right. day. Don't get me started. I, you know, I'm not a professional programmer, not by any means, but um, I have, I'm a hobbyist programmer and I've written, written some software that's been, you know, distributed and used. And, but I just do it mostly for fun. And it's because I have that luxury. I can, I can use arcane and weirdo languages like fourth and, but when I once I found Lisp about five or six years ago, I just said, this is it. This is the greatest language ever written. It was, in fact, almost the first language ever written from 1956. It's as old as I am. <laughs> but it still lives on. It's a wonderful, it's a, it's a wonderful language. And I, I don't think I could say the same for COBOL, to be honest with you. I think you got to do the Carlton to this dance. I mean, to this song. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I don't know. I just, it sounds like a kind of a Carlton y kind of song. Uh, Skyler on the line from Cooper City, Florida. Hello, Skyler. Hey, Leo. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Doing just great here. Just fine. Thank you. I've been really a fan of yours for many years. Oh. Thank you for your knowledge and sharing. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Good, good. I'm glad you listened. So, hey, Mike. Yeah, and even back in the old days when you were on TV, it was a long time, way back. Way back when, when I still had a face for television. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do for you? <laughs> well, um, I've got a lot of extra time on my hands, so I've decided to start scanning my tens of thousands of photos for, so each of my three kids can have copies of them. Isn't that nice? And, uh, Isn't that nice? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's a lot of fun. Kind of get to go back and rem reminisce and photos, things like that, so it's good for me, too. I love it. And, you know, nowadays, because of digital... Uh, you know, my mom had, uh, my mom and dad took slides when I was a kid. And so she had a, you know, a carousel and about 50 carousels in her closet. And I was always saying, well, can we, can we borrow them so we can look at them? And she said, no, 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 I don't want to lose them. So finally we digitized them all. And now, you know, I have like the Google photo frame, the Nest Hub Max. And I see those pictures all the time on the frame. It's great. They're, they're not buried anymore. So getting getting them digitized is a great idea, not just for preservation, but so that people can see them. Yep. And they all get a copy. That's right. That's so, right. So are these prints? What are these? What are these originals? Yeah, these are prints. These are prints that I've taken. Oh, and some prints are from my mom and my grandmother. So it spans generations. Here. Oh, you want to take good care of those? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I want to scan them. So I, the scanner I started to do this one is about seven or eight years old. But I'm starting to think, well, maybe there's better technology. Oh, there is. <laughs> so Epson makes a, it's a little pricey, but it's designed to do this. It's called the Fast Photo Wireless High Speed Photo Scanner. Okay. And it's it, what it has is a sheet feeder. So that's what makes it really fast. You could put a stack of photos in there and it's going to go as fast as one per second. Boom, boom, boom. Now, obviously, it's not going to. That's not indicated for, you know, depends on the photos. If you have those portraits you got done at a studio, they're not going to fit through it. If it's got staples on it, it's not going to work. But the vast majority of your prints, if you've got shoeboxes full of prints, those will get through them real fast. Uh, it handles Polaroids. It handles trading cards. You can do up to 36 photos in a batch. Uh, it also does, it has software to enhance it and color correct it. So I think that's a pretty good starting point. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
Now, it's also expensive. Um, any other solution is going to be really slow. You probably already experienced this. I bet you you got one where you put it in the thing, you close the lid, you press the button, now you take it out in one. Yeah, life is too short if you've got... <laughs> <laughs> You've got a thousand photos. That's going to take forever. So the other way to do it, which uh, is fast and less expensive, is to get a camera. And it doesn't have to be a super good camera. Most even point and shoots nowadays have enough resolution to get those. But you want lights and an easel and a, and a tripod so that everything is fixed in place. And you can set up the lighting so there's no glare, but it's even. And then once you got that all set... You just put a picture on the easel, press the button. Put a picture on the easel, press the button. Put a picture on the easel, so you can do it pretty quick. Yeah, but that's worth. But to do that right, so that you don't, you know, just go crazy, you're going to get a, a little easel. You're going to get a tripod for the camera, and you can. You don't have to be fancy lights. You can even be regular lights, or go to the hardware store and get shop lights. But just, just so that it may be a couple, so you don't have any shadows or, or, and you don't want glare either. So you'll play with it till you get just the right setup. Remember that the camera sensor has to be exactly parallel to the picture at exactly the picture's height, so that you don't have any distortion by uh, angular uh, displacement, things like that. So that's a very fast way to do it that actually produces excellent results. Good. Very good. I, I had another uh, question going back to the... Sure. Stands. Hold on just a second because I just want to make sure Chris is there and ready to go. Hi, Chris. You ready to go? I am here and ready to go. All right. He's our photo guy, so if he has to, wants to pitch in, he can too. Go ahead, Skylar. Okay, great. So if, we, if I would go out and start looking for a, a new scanner, what are the specifics I should look for to get a good scanner? Scanner, but Not so much the Mac manufacturer or the model, but you know the certain specs on it. What would tell me it's a great scanner? Um, well, you know, Epson and Canon are the two companies that I would look at. I wouldn't get get it from a weird name company. You definitely want to get, honestly, this fast photo is the best scanner for this. Um, what resolution, Chris, do you like to scan photos at for archival preservation? Oh, fo photos are usually around 300 dpi. It doesn't have to be plenty. more than that because uh, the photo doesn't, doesn't really have a have lot of resolution. Yeah. If you want to blow them up really big, then maybe 1,200 dpi. But I wouldn't go beyond that because it also makes the scanner very slow. Right. And if you have many photos to scan, then it'll just take too long. So the maximum would be 1,200, but most scanners will do at least 300, and that's fine. And you want to be able to scan into JPEG, but most of the time you'll scan into, because storage is no longer expensive, into a TIFF format, which is a uh, high-quality format. But any scanner should do that. Okay, great. Very good. That'll do it then. I appreciate it. Good, Skylar. Thank you. Great project. Have okay. fun. Bye bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. More tech eye in just a bit, but first a word from Nareva. You've heard me talking about this before. People heading back to the office. We'll be opening up our office in a few weeks, I think. We know, though, that the way we uh, have meetings will change. Distancing can have a big implications for the meeting room. Uh, in particular for meeting room audio and meeting room configuration. You know, you have to separate people. Uh, sometimes people are facing in unusual directions in order to support that, you know, social distancing. You need great microphone coverage on those conference calls. But how do you do it? You could try, I guess, a beam forming system, except those are really expensive. And they take a technician to come and to set it up. And then you'll probably have to tell people, you even put a little mark on the table. I've seen that. Sit here. Or you can have microphones, same thing, sit in front of the microphone, but then after every meeting you have to sanitize them, that's no fun. Wouldn't it be nice to get clear, reliable audio and let your team act naturally, but still feel safe? That's Nareva. In fact, one analyst called Nareva the first socially distanced mic system. It's using their patented microphone mist technology, four different patents. It's a uniquely original approach to audio conferencing. It's designed for distancing. In effect, using technology, computer technology, it puts a thousand microphones in the room so people can sit where they want, face where they want, and still be perfectly clear crystal audio. So there's a couple of different models depending on the size of the room. The HDL 300, that's their big system. It's actually the first microphone and speaker bar to be certified for large meeting spaces. I mean, when I say large, I mean 15 feet by 28 feet big. Perfect for staff meetings, things like that. It fills the room with thousands of virtual microphones. The audio adapts automatically. 
You get true full room coverage. People can be heard from anywhere in the room. You don't have to run a microphone over to them. You don't want to do that in this day and age, right? Any way they face, anywhere they're distanced, no matter where they sit. And no technicians necessary, no configuration. You can install the microphone and speaker bar on the wall yourself. I've done it. It's very simple, very easy. You also get, with every Nareva system, the device management console, which lets you adjust settings, install firmware updates, check device status, all from a secure cloud-based platform. You could set up the meeting room without even, before you even go to the meeting room from your office. Console is included with every Nareva audio system. And when you enroll your system, you're going to get an extra year of warranty absolutely free. Nareva audio products are very popular. HubSpot uses the uh, big one, the HDL 300. Jimmy Yan's their principal collaboration engineer. He said, quote, we were so impressed with the sound quality, the ease of install, the ease of use of the HDL 300. It was a no-brainer for us to adopt it. That's what they use. You might want the HDL 200. It just won the new top new technology award at the ISE 2020. And no matter what size your room, what configuration, Nareva has a full line of systems for small, medium, or large spaces. To learn more about how Nareva Audio, N-U-R-E-V-A, how Nareva Audio is the simple, cost-effective way to let your teams distance in meetings and still act and converse naturally and, most importantly, be heard, Go to Nareva.com slash twit. N-U-R-E-V-A, Nareva.com slash twit. Thank you, Nareva, for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. Thank you for supporting us by using that address so they know you saw it here. Nareva.com slash twit. Nareva. Now back to the show. Do you love to take photographs? Well, you're in luck because Chris Marquardt is here, my personal photo sensei at sensei.photo, S-E-N-S-E-I. That's where he does his photo coaching. Chris is a very accomplished digital photographer, travel expert, uh, and used to work for HP. So he can also talk about printers, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Chris. <laughs> well, I, I, did, I did work for HP, but never, never with a printer, guys. So, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> that was a long time ago. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's also a great podcaster. You got to listen to his tips from the top floor podcast and the future photography podcast. His books, as long as I'm giving you a plug, let's give you a plug for everything on wide angle photography, film photography, just excellent. I have them all. <laughs> and uh, you can find out more at sensei.photo. So we had a photo assignment. Zigzag. Zigzag, which marks the, the, la the last letter in the alphabet. We went through the entire alphabet over the last, well, so many months. And uh, Zigzag is the last one. We're not quite finished with the alphabet. You'll find out at the end of the segment. But um, I have, of course, chosen three photos from the Zigzag. Well, and this lots was a really of good Zigzag time. pictures. I think this Amazing one actually got some people photos. going. Yeah, yeah. This was this was really really uh, something that people jumped on and and brought really amazing photos. So I chose three photos that we want to talk about. The first one is by Alex Zarnowski, Wired Shoes, <laughs> and uh, what we're looking at is a sunset kind of scene. We see clouds in the sky. The clouds are lit by the sun. There's a building in, at the bottom. You can clearly see it's an evening sunset kind of thing. And then there's zigzagging wires up uh, across the sky as a silhouette. But that's not just not just power lines. It's it's also there's a bird sitting on it and there's a pair of shoes hanging off of them. And uh, I don't know, there's a story in there somewhere. And uh, it's a beautiful photo from the from the colors. It covers the zigzag topic because course those lines are beautifully zigzagging it's an so, emotional good job. picture it brings it up yes. emotions a feeling of a time of day and a kind of a, a kind of certain serenity and stuff it's and good what's, and what's yeah. up with these shoes across power lines i've never understood why people do that well i could tell you the story but then we'd have to sidetrack the <laughs> show considerably <laughs> so we'll just we'll it just, is a nice photo. there it is a signal but we'll we'll talk about that another time these shoes are okay. not are not I would say the power company would not be happy because it looks like they're joining Probably four not. power lines together in a way that's not quite appropriate. But okay. It's okay. a good picture. Lovely. Yep. Good job, Alex. Second one by Ron Hikes, 816 NYC Views. And I am such a fan of this photo. Mm, We're looking absolutely. at another sunny day photo and uh, the sun is higher up in the sky and the photo is straight onto 
um, straight on to a brick building with a fire escape. And that fire escape is green, the bricks are red, so there's a n nice, amazing color contrast there, primary color contrast, which is always a great thing in photos. And then the zigzagging uh, fire escape, of course, but it's also casting a zigzagging bunch of shadows at the wall, which, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just such a, it's a fun photo to look at. Because it's really guys, yeah. the, the zigzags are all over the place, but it's wonderful. I, I really like the um, colors in this one. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. The green and the red, they go together so well. I mean, there's probably a reason they painted the fire escape for green. And it's such a great find with such a light. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing photo. Very nice. Good job. Another, and another great not photo ace. from our viewers or listeners. That's nice. Thank you, Ron. Okay. And, the, and the next one is an almost an abstract one by Larry Albauer, wow. uh, Zigzag Stairway. And I, if Stairway, I wouldn't really know. You can't it tell. Is, it looks like Kandinsky's painting. It doesn't look like a photo yes, at all. Yes. So many different colors and yeah angles and zigs and zags and uh, again we, we have primary color contrast in there again makes it nice the blue and the yellow contrasting against each other um and then yeah there is a staircase somewhere in there but it's it's kind of broken up by i guess the glass railing sidings that are i would think made like that on purpose so it's, it's 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 probably a staircase and an art installation at the same time it's beautiful that's what it looks yeah it's beautiful. Yeah, and the photo, the photo, the photo is, it's it's worth that photo. That photo is is like the the the, the building. It is really, um, it does it justice. Yeah, let's put it that way. Really gorgeous. Wow, so, some yes, great absolutely. images. I think you picked a very good subject. But now, <laughs> now you have a problem, Chris Marquardt. Because we were going alphabetically A through Z, we're we're done. We could we could go backwards, right? I guess no, so. no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have one uh, last alphabet-related assignment, and it is called the alphabet assignment. And what I want to do is I want the audience to find letters. Oh, and I like take it. Photos of them. Yeah. But but I I, do, I want I want to be specific here. I'm not looking for actual letters. Like don't go and find signs and then take pictures of those letters on the signs, but instead find things that look like letters, that mm. make the shape of letters. So something, I, I don't know, a simple one would be an O, which might be something round, but then there's other letters that are uh, quite a bit more difficult, could be made from shadows, could be made from uh, just things interacting that that, again, not, not actual letters, but things that make letters. And I think this could actually become a bit of a group exercise because i mean let's be honest it's going to be hard to get the whole alphabet together but wouldn't that be amazing oh if that'd we be got fun the whole alphabet together so the the Flickr group um where we put these photos um i'll put a post on there where people can discuss and kind of look up your chance of having your your, your letter on there is going to be much much greater if it's a letter that is not already submitted to the assignment ah, so. so that's a little extra thing you have to check the it's assignments it's an extra thing i mean to see if we did 26 <laughs> assignments this is the 27th there should be a bit more extra effort in they there. call that pareidolia that's a very human tendency to see yes. things usually faces in natural objects but this time we're looking for yes. letters in the clouds in the cement wherever not real letters though right you don't or do you want real letters does it matter? No, 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 no. I, no. I specifically want things that are not real letters. They're not real letters. It's just they look like, they're letter-like. And uh, can it we get... Be, it, could, it could be twigs, twigs that cross and yeah. make an X shape or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Pareidolia. That'd be kind of an interesting uh, thing. All right, and Chris. tag is alphabet, TG alphabet. So here's what why you need to know the tag. You're going to upload your image to uh, the Flickr group. Flickr is a photo sharing site at Flickr.com. There's a tech guy group there. Renee Silverman, our moderator, will accept it. We do want you to tag it TG for tech guy, TG alphabet. So we know it's the alphabet assignment. And Chris will give you four weeks. That means four different images. And uh, he'll review them all next in a month. Thank you, Chris. You'll find Chris Marquardt 
at sensei.photo. Thanks, Chris. Have a great day. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number on the line. Carmen from Victorville, California. Hello, Carmen. Oh, hi, Leo. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. How are you? Okay, I'm trying to make a banana bread here. Oh, please. You're not so far away. I'll be right up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> I have a weird question, maybe, because it has to do with email and Verizon. Okay. I read that Verizon sold their email, the American <laughs> Online Service, yes. to another company. Yes. <laughs> and now I've had that forever, and I am wondering how is that going to affect the service? And if I was to like go to another provider besides Verizon, could I take the email with me? So it's kind of a two-question. Um, yeah, that's going to be an issue, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah. I don't know if they made a deal to continue using AOL's service after the sale. That would be what I would hope Verizon would do, so it would not change anything. But, you know, <laughs> they've changed this a couple of times. Uh, Verizon had its own mail, then they bought Yahoo, and they made it Yahoo Mail. Right. Uh Actually, in the, in the Verizon.net mail was AOL. Then they bought Yahoo Mail and they made it Yahoo. They've sold off Yahoo and, and AOL. It's all gone now. Verizon yeah. realized, oh, maybe we should just stick to phones or something. I don't know. Um, I That's a really interesting question. I think here's what I would recommend. Rather than tying yourself to the to whatever... <laughs> the winds of change bring Verizon because who knows what's going to happen next. They don't seem to have a, a email is not their core business. Let's put it that way. Right. I generally tell people not to use the email provided by your Internet service provider or your cell carrier because you don't want to be tied to them. What if you said one day you got a better deal from T-Mobile and the and, and you said, I'm going to go to T-Mobile. Well, now it's they've really got you, don't they? So yep. that's why they do it, but it's generally why I say it's better not to have your email service tied to a company you use for other things. So this might be the opportunity for you to try something else. A lot of people use Gmail. I'm not a fan of Gmail because I think it's, while it's not exactly the same, it's similar. You're now tied to the fortunes of Google. Mm. Well, I don't think Google's going anywhere, and at least Google's in this business they're not a, you know, they're right. <laughs> right? They're not a phone so, and, and the nice thing about Google is it's free. So if you're looking for free email, I think Gmail is a good choice. I'll tell you how you can make this transition as smooth as possible in a second. Okay. But, but so that's what I would recommend. Or if not Gmail, then look at one of the many paid email services. They're not expensive. They're typically around $10 a year. I like that even better because that's their business. That's their only business. And I often wonder, you know, email is so important. Why are we so tied to getting it for free? You know, pay a couple of bucks a month and get something good. <laughs> right? You know, yeah. it's important. And then you won't have problems like this. In fact, the best thing to do, this is a little more, this is the, the advanced tip, a little more sophisticated. The best thing to do is to get it, is to buy an email address that's your family name or something. And then you can forward it wherever you want. So if you decide, you know, you could, you could have done that and had it go to AOL. But then you say, well, I don't want to keep going to AOL. You don't have to tell anybody your new address. You just have the company that does the forwarding forward it somewhere else. So that's the, advan the most advanced tip. And that's what I do and what I tell people. If you can, you know, get it together to do this. This, this kind of ends your email woes forever. You know, if if I got Laporte.com as my email address and Leo at Laporte.com was my email address, that would be great. And I wouldn't necessarily – I could have G, it be go to Gmail. I could have it go to AOL. I could have it go to Verizon. You wouldn't even know. You'd just send me email at Leo at Laporte.com. So that's a good way to go. Maybe get the family name or something that's meaningful to you. 
Uh, if you're a business, you certainly should have your business name. You shouldn't have your mail going to AOL or Hotmail or Gmail even. It should be going to your business name. So that's the advanced tip. Now, here's the problem. You, you're all in on AOL. Everybody you know is sending email to AOL. Right. So what I would do first is set up a new account and have the mail that goes to AOL.com forwarded. You can do that. And as long as Verizon continues to offer AOL.com, and I bet you they will, you'll be all right. People will still send it to that address. But you might have in your signature, hey, we've moved our email address. From now on, please email me at Carmen at Santiago.com. I, I know your name is not Carmen Santiago, but that's an yeah, example. No. <laughs> no. Where in the world is Carmen Santiago? So, um, so you could do that, right? Um, and then uh, over a year or two, you know, slowly, if AOL disappears, you can also get all the mail that's stored on AOL.com, and you should do that now. When you get your mail uh, from Verizon, do you go to a website to do it? I, you know, uh, Leo, I am so illiterate when it comes to computers. I, I just know the basics. Yeah, so I've given you, uh, I've probably given you way more than you can digest at yeah. this point. But well, you, you know, I, I, I can learn, so you can... Uh, no, you're learn, smart. So maybe yeah. Like. Yeah, you're smart. Okay. So so uh, I always assume that anybody who listens to this show is extremely intelligent. So, <laughs> but you may not know about computers. That's fine. That doesn't mean you're, you know, exactly. you, you can't do this. It's just, it's, you know, it's not something you ever learned about. Um, so I would suggest the first thing you want to do is kind of get your mail that's currently on the AOL servers. And there's a number of ways to do that. Probably the best way is to set up a, an email client. Do you have a computer or is it just your phone? I'm currently using more my tablet. I do have a okay. Mac computer. But, whose whose uh, tablet are you using? Updated. Yeah, we can do it on the tablet. What tablet are you using? Or is it an iPad or an Android? Uh, no, an iPad. Oh, yeah, perfect. IPad. So the iPad, as you know, has a mail program on it. It's called Mail. Have you ever used it? Okay. <laughs> I'm sure I have. It may already be getting your email from AOL. If it is, oh. you're fine. It's downloading that mail. But if it's not, then you can set up Apple Mail to log into your AOL email. Verizon has the uh, instructions on how to set that up. If you actually, you could, you could Google uh, Apple iOS Mail Verizon AOL, and those five words or six words would give you a page. It would say, here's how to get your Verizon mail in Apple's I iPad email program. And you set it up. And then uh -huh. now you've got all your email on your iPad, which is a good start. Okay. Right? Is that go, does that go to the cloud? Uh, in this case, it goes to your iPad. The iPad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's in the cloud right now. Uh, it's in AOL's cloud. Uh, what you'd like to do is eventually set up another email company. Maybe go to gmail.com. Do you have a, you probably already have, most people do a Gmail account. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do have one. So the other thing you can do, this might even be better, Gmail ha will let you get your mail from the Verizon, from AOL. So this is a new Google search, <laughs> which is Gmail. Okay. Verizon, AOL, and it will say how to configure, you want to find out how to configure your Gmail to get your Verizon mail. Oh, okay. Um, and if, it, if you can do that, then all your email will be now on Gmail. Gmail, okay. And that means it's saved forever. Google will save it. So then you're then you're pretty much you can then tell all your correspondents, oh, I'm no longer Carmen at AOL.com, I'm Carmen at gmail.com. Okay. Okay. That's probably the first step. That's something you can do. Okay. Um and uh you have to it's comp it's a little complicated, but if you Google it, you'll see there's a way to do it. And then you all the mail will be in Gmail now. All right, everything that I have. Okay. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I will, um, 
I will put a、uh, link in our show notes at techguylabs.com to an article that will describe what to do. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it because it's been bothering me since I read that.、Uh, yeah, I don't blame you. And I don't think Verizon has said what's going to happen. My guess is they're going to just say, at least for a while, we're going to. You know, rent AOL.com, you know, rent that email service so we don't have to disturb your. But eventually you're going to want to move off of it for this very reason. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So the camera I use, somebody's asking about the camera I used for the Mach E ad, is actually、uh, it's a 360 degree camera. So、um, I have had an, quite a few of these <laughs> over the years, including the GoPro Fusion. And the Ricoh Theta.、Um, I got the one, Anthony, we were using Anthony's personal camera, so I got one to duplicate it for additional shooting. It's、uh, called the Insta 360. And I'll just show you.、Um, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, everybody seems to like this one. I don't know if it's the best one.、Um, I think the Ricoh Theta that I have is, might be a little bit better, but this is the one I use, the X2. And the reason I use this is because Anthony, first of all, we shot the first half in it, but also Anthony's comfortable with editing it. So it does not follow me. It shoots everything. It's a 360 degree camera, so it shoots everything. And then Anthony is able to pick, you know, take that and crop it around. And in editing, he can pick what he wants. So,、um, if this is more modern than the Ricoh Theta that I have, so, so that's kind of cool, right?、Uh, it does have some software features that are, are cool to help with that, like leveling the horizon but, and image stabilization. But it's pretty cool and it's very high quality. So, I, it's probably the one I'd get. It's not as expensive as the Theta. So, it's the Insta360. One and the new one is X2. That's the one I have. And I, have it, I had it on a,、uh, a monopod. I was just holding it. They sell, I think they sell as an as a,、uh, accessory at monopod, but I didn't use theirs. I just happen to have a lot of monopods. Do, not the Pro $5,000 one, <laughs> the $414 Insta360 1X2. And yeah, they sell this. They call it the invisible selfie stick. Every selfie stick's invisible because of the way the thing works. I actually have one that's a little bit better than this. But、um, so, that, yeah, this is basically how I was holding it. And then it, it kind of erases that, your, this area here below it. And then Anthony, using, I don't know what he's using, Final Cut, I guess, no, Premiere maybe,、um, is able to take whatever part of it he wants. So it was actually a great way to shoot because. I didn't have to aim the camera or anything. I just had to hold it. And then it, it was able to.、Uh, so we didn't need a camera operator or a sound guy. Then for the sound, I was using the Mic Me, which is also cool.、Um, this is a very weird product, but it works really well. So it's, I'm using the, I was using the Mic Me Pocket. So, the way it works is it's got a, I had a lav mic on that was connected to this, which is on my belt. <clears throat> and then it pairs to the iPhone. And、uh, so it, it actually records locally, but it also,、uh, and I think we use the local recordings, but it also sends it to the iPhone. And if you the, use the iPhone, the Mic Me uh, uh, video camera on the iPhone, not the iPhone's camera, but the Mic Me's camera, Uh, it'll sync it all up automatically, which makes it really easy. So it's really cool because you basically, you know, you don't have to, you have a wireless mic and it works quite well. It doesn't, it's the way it works is really interesting. <laughs> it doesn't、uh, send it through, it doesn't do it live, which is very expensive and not very reliable. It sends it、uh, over time. Catches up. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, 
digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, how hackers work, how they don't work, ransomware, anything on your mind. If it has to do with tech, I'd love to talk about it with you. Now, my phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO. That's a toll-free number, 888-827-5536. It's toll-free in the U.S. and Canada. But because it's toll-free here, you can call it with Skype out, and it shouldn't cost you anything uh, because it's a toll-free number, right? So uh, if you're outside of the U.S. or Canada, use Skype or something like that to call, and it should still be a free call. 8888-ASK-LEO. If you hear something on the show and you say, oh, I got to... Got to keep track of that. Or if, like Carmen, I've given you very complicated instructions that are impossible to follow, don't worry, because James DeRuvo's following it. He's our scribe. He's writing it all down and putting it up on the website so you don't have to remember it. You don't have to follow it. You can open up the web page and, and copy, a, like a recipe, copy what I say. And that's all up there at techguylabs.com. Best part, no charge. You get what you pay for. It's free. <laughs> TechGuyLabs.com. There's a search. There's 1,802 shows up there. This is episode 1,803 in a 14-year quest. No, I'm sorry, 17-year quest to figure out what the heck is going on with this technology thing. Vic is on the line from Vista, California. Hi, Vic. Hello? Hello. Hello. Welcome to the radio show. This is David in Los Angeles. Oh, I picked up the wrong one. I'll, I'll talk to you next, Vic. Hi, David. Hi there. Thanks for taking the call. You Hello? Mean, you mean me? So, yes, uh, you. <laughs> so um, so I had to get a new computer because my old one was dying. And then I, I put on Dropbox on my new computer. And I didn't know this, but apparently... Dropbox by default backs up everything on your computer and it starts barking at you. You're out of space upgrade now for two uh, terabytes because I'm at two gigs. And I went on the, the the community forum. Apparently everybody's having this problem. And the, one of the problems is, is I thought, okay, well, fine. I just use my Dropbox for my voiceover stuff. Um, so I'll just go to delete files. But what, but what it'll do, it'll say, oh, you're going to delete from Dropbox and your computer. Yeah. Isn't that annoying? I freaking. So I, I've been right clicking on files and sometimes it deletes them, but then I'll get a message saying, this will be leading from Dropbox in your computer. So, Leo, I don't want, you know, first of all, I want you to like scold Dropbox for doing this, scaring us to upgrade when we don't need to. Well, here's the problem it's not exactly their fault because mm -hmm. people think, as you have apparently, that Dropbox is a backup solution, which it's not. Well, I didn't want it to back up my whole computer. No, I no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, and that's something they rolled out, which I do blame them for, which is, uh, so it used to be Dropbox. The only thing it ever backed up was a folder called Dropbox. But, uh -huh. then, but then they got, uh, they realized, oh, people, actually, this was something that people demanded, I think, or it maybe it was an excuse to get you to pay for more storage. But they realized people wanted to back up you know, their entire My Documents folder or their entire My Pictures folder. And so they started doing that. They did warn you there's a little pop-up and so forth, but probably, you know, you just, as most of us do, said, okay, fine, whatever. Get out of my way. You get two gigabytes for free. That's not very much. But as you say, if it's just, uh, if it were just the Dropbox folder where I keep my voice files, fine. Now, the reason they delete it when you delete it locally is because it's not backup, it's sync. And I think this is, um, you know, they should do a better job of explaining that, but I'll do it for them. Sync means that the Dropbox folder on your computer and the Dropbox folder in the cloud are matches. So that means it synchronizes deletions as well as new files. Mm -hmm. They do that for a couple of reasons. One, to save storage. But two, because that's what sync means. That's not what backup means. Backup is different. Backup's a one-way thing where everything I create on this computer, I want you to store in the cloud. Even if I delete it, I want you to store it in the cloud. In fact, especially if I delete it, I want you to store it in the cloud because I don't want it to. I don't want synchronized deletions. So I have iDrive, so I don't need to do that. Exactly. iDrive's backup. Dropbox is sync. So what I would suggest you do is move those files that you don't want it to delete, make a copy of them somewhere else on your hard drive, somewhere that Dropbox is not backing up. You can go into Dropbox settings and look in the smart sync settings and see what folders is backing up and turn off anything you don't want it to back up. That's for sure. 
Ideally, you should use it the way you used to use it, the way you're used to, which is there is a folder called Dropbox that is the one and only folder Dropbox is, is copying. Mm -hmm. And that's where you put your voice files, right? So how can I make sure when I'm right-clicking on these files? I'm on Dropbox right now. When I right-click on a file, and then it will delete, but then sometimes it'll say, oh, you're going to delete it from your computer. Do yeah, you because it's it? sync. So you don't, <laughs> you don't, you, yeah. So what you want to do is put those precious five <laughs> items somewhere else. <laughs> because the minute you delete them from your computer, it deletes them from Dropbox. Now, the good news is it doesn't delete them immediately. You have like 30 days to change your mind. So it is still up there. It's just you have to undelete it. So I'm looking here, and it, there's a, a, a blue icon with the uh, with the you know the yin yang arrows or whatever. So I guess that's sync. So is there a way to like turn off the sync for each file? Yeah. So I, you may have also enabled. Somebody's saying in the chat room they also have a backups tab. So you may may be in the backups tab. It may be in the smart sync tab. But. So but yeah, the, idea, the idea is mm -hmm. to take whatever you don't want to sync out of that folder, or, or better yet, make a copy, hmm. right? And then if you delete, so, so I'm imagining, here's what I'm imagining. You use Dropbox so you can send voice files to clients. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. Right. So it's a, it's, a, it's a way of basically make publishing them so that the client can have a copy of it. So you have a folder, voice tracks, that you do synchronize with Dropbox. But my suggestion is that you don't make that the main folder. You don't save your voice tracks there. You save your voice tracks into a voice tracks folder somewhere else. And then the ones you want to make public to give to your clients, you move to that Dropbox folder. Mm -hmm. And then you give them the Dropbox URL. That's the sharing link. And then they can get it. And when they're done with it, you delete it in, in locally in your Dropbox folder, and it's deleted in both places. That saves you space. And it's actually the way Dropbox was meant to use. I agree. They muddied the waters when they added this backups feature. Because mm. now it's doing everything. So you're saying copy a folder to somewhere on my computer. Anywhere that's not in the backups or smart sync directories. Okay, and yeah. then I can delete it. Yeah, yeah. And then go to backups and say, don't sync my stuff. <laughs> yeah, so when you said back, when you allowed them to do the backups, they just basically put all of your files in, in the Dropbox. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not what you want because it's not, <laughs> A, it uses up a lot of space, and B, there's this risk of deleting it. I think yeah. the reason you don't see that warning every time is if it is something Dropbox is backing up, it won't do that. If it's something it's syncing, it will do that. But they muddy the waters by doing both things, which is confusing. So my takeaway is um, to copy stuff that, like my documents or pictures or whatever like that. Um, but, the, you know, there's... Turn off, turn off the feature in Dropbox that says backups, first of all. Because you, you don't want it to be backing stuff up. That's a waste of your space. You only have two gigs. So turn that off. That's, that's something that got turned on by accident. You never really wanted that because you have a lot more storage. You know, you need a lot more storage. You use iDrive for that, and that's sensible. So, so back up your PC automatically, and I uncheck documents, uh, desktop, yes. and download. Yes, because right? basically what it did, when you those are checked, they're moved into the Dropbox folder, and they're synchronizing, which yeah. is not what you now want. It's saying, now it's saying key contents and folders on this PC, and that's what I want, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. So stop backup. And then, and then have a voice tracks folder that is smart synced because that's the one you want when you save the file, you know, from, that you just recorded so that you can right click it even on your computer and get the Dropbox link and give and email that to the client. Right. So now all three folders stopping back up. It's doing the spinning wheel thing. Yeah. Cause it's, mo it's actually moving them. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little annoying. Uh, this is a, a really good example of what happens all the time in the tech industry, which is a company that is a perfectly valid niche. In fact, they invented it. It's it's a it's a wonderful tool and service. They decided they wanted more. They want to be a backup company too. So they've added new features, and it's not only confusing to people; it's doing. And you're not the only person this happens to. It's doing bad oh, things to people. The community forum is like, hey, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, so it looks like here, and I appreciate your time. 
so it looks like here that all that stuff, um, it's gone from my Dropbox, and then. But the as long as it's still on your drive. Yeah. That's the main so thing. It's, yeah. It's just my PC desktop, and then there's that blue dot with the sync thing. So. I guess, um, I don't know. Yeah, and that's the thing is you you can make any, it used to be just a, a folder called Dropbox, but now any arbitrary folder can be a Dropbox. But make sure that only the folders where you want synchronization with Dropbox. So all the other folders that I do want on a Dropbox have the green circle with the check mark, and right. then the PC one has that blue thing with the rotating arrows or the yin-yang arrows. That means it hasn't oh, been okay. copied yet. So it says, don't sync to dropbox.com. So I'll click that. Um, okay. So, so much fun. So it won't be there on your other devices. So I click don't sync on that. Yeah. And then. Um, they really made it so confusing. If all, if all they said was, look, you have a Dropbox. That's synchronized to the cloud. That's it. That's all we do. We do it really well. Thank you very much. We'll take your five yeah. bottle dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope I did this right, and I already deleted some stuff, right-click, but now it looks like it said don't stop the backup, so all that stuff disappeared from my Dropbox, so it looks like it's back where it should be. Because I take webinars and stuff and courses online, and then they put the stuff on Dropbox. Yeah. So, you know, I take some coaching, and so that I want to keep that, um, and that's all I want to so, use Dropbox for. So the easiest thing when they do that, you could just open it with your Dropbox account, then then it's in, they don't even have a copy of it. But if you want to keep it beyond like your membership in Dropbox, you put it somewhere else in your hard drive as well. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Leo. David, I'm sorry this happened to you. I, I'm glad we could spend some time with it because I think you're not alone. And everybody, who, thank you for waiting. I know you want to talk to Leo, so thank you for your patience. Well. <laughs> David, you waited. Right. Vic's gonna yeah. gonna be mad at me, but that's all right. I, I blew it. I Absolutely. named him by accident. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> thank you, sir. Have a great day. Thank you, uh, Matt, and uh, others in the Discord for helping me understand all of that. I I've used it all, but it's so dang confusing. I don't blame everybody. So Dropbox uses the Windows Live. See, I don't use Dropbox on the on Windows. So it basically uses the library, Windows Libraries feature to put downloads, desktop pictures, and documents into the Dropbox. That's why it's backing up everything and using up all its storage. Yes, Dropbox does hold the encryption keys, so it's not fully private. Although, as Matt pointed out, they do have a new encrypted folder on there. Um, I guess I really like sync thing. That's what I use now, um, and it and it's a, it's a really good way of doing it. But it's synchronization. It's not backup, so it's separate from my backup. My I also use a, a NAS for backup. But uh, the sync thing means that I have a, a number of folders that are on all my systems, and it works Windows, Mac, and Linux open source, and uh, it, it doesn't use an intermediary third party in the cloud. It just is peer-to-peer -peer sync. So I have, for instance, my documents folder, and every machine I use is a uh, sync thing. So anything I create on any one of those computers is available on all of those computers. Uh, and you can have it synchronized deletions or not. It's actually pretty pretty good for that. Let me, uh, let me open up a sync thing. Yes? Are you clicking me? Am I being clicked? So, in this case, this computer doesn't have a lot of storage, so I only sync the default sync folder, which is out of sync. But you see, if I go into, if I edit it, um, I share it, I can share it with a variety of other computers. Um, it allows you to do some really cool file versioning, including... Um, It'll rotate backups and only delete stuff that's a year or more older, or it will uh, continue to have it forever, or you can put it in the trash can, or you can keep the most recent five versions. So it's very sophisticated that way. Uh, and then in the advanced dialog, you can say, this is a sync folder, or this is a send-only folder, which means that if I create something, it'll automatically get replicated 
or it's a receive only, which means nothing I create here will get replicated, but I'll only receive things rep created on other computers. So this is that's a really nice feature that that I think makes it very simple to not accidentally delete something you wish you had. <laughs> oh, I love this song. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. Now it's your turn, Vic from Vista. Hello. Sorry to keep you on. That last guy took all my, my he took all my time. <laughs> uh, no, he didn't. You get the same amount. Right. I'll give it all I to you. Be, I'll be quick with this. I know I have okay. Um, we're having an earthquake swarm down here off the Salton Sea. Oh we're yikes. All hoping uh, that it's not a foreshock to something bigger. It's not usually it means it's a stress bigger. reliever and you, you, you it is. cross well, your fingers. Are, you know, these are fives, so they're not that big. Uh, Still, anyway, five's not small. You'll feel it, yeah. The damage in Imperial County. but uh, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. In any event, uh, my question has to do with all the hacking that's going on. And I read, or maybe I heard it on the radio or TV, about someone suggested you could actually turn off the Internet to certain countries if, if they're found to be where it's coming from. Or the companies the strategic companies could turn their systems into intranets where they're not right. exposed to the outside. And finally, the work-at-home people, they shouldn't open up these links that they don't know. Is there a way they could be blocked from doing that? So I'd like your, you know, if you have any input on that, what could be so done? So it's a, it's a very difficult problem. Oh. And uh, there's no perfect solution. I'm glad to see that, that the U.S. government's taking it seriously because it does, you know, there's all sorts of ways to solve this, including diplomatic channels. So the issue yeah. is all security is a matter of layers. There's no one thing that's perfect. You're going to use multi, any business is going to use multiple layers to protect themselves. Uh, I'll start with the last one first. You definitely have to teach employees to be very careful about what they open. Uh, not only at, and nowadays, not only at work, but when they're at home, because they're usually, you know, connected to the office network. And if they get a virus at home, they may transmit it immediately to the office or they may bring the laptop into work and transmit it then. So every employee has to be taught to be aware of things like phishing attacks. And these particular ransomware attacks almost always use something called spear phishing, which is essentially targeted phishing. They're emails that have knowledge of the company, the management structure, and often what the employee does. So they'll send a email to the office manager right. saying from the from the boss saying, hey, here's a spreadsheet uh, that needs to be updated with uh, all of the uh, f all extensions in the office. Uh, the office manager says, well, it's from the boss. This can't be uh, uh, you know, malware, it's from the boss and it's an attachment, but uh, but I'm just going to open it. Yeah, it's an Excel spreadsheet, but it also has a payload that is now infected her computer. So the, that's called spear phishing. So it, training employees to be aware of that's very, very, very important because that's how these bad guys target the, the company. Now, the Colonial Pipeline attack didn't use spear phishing. It turned out there were VPNs being used to log into Colonial Pipeline by employees, and one of the passwords had leaked. It was an account no longer being used, but still active. So the bad guys were able to just log in using that leaked password. So that's another problem. Password management has to be, you have to rotate them. You have to make sure that nobody's reusing passwords, that the security is high. There's all sorts of things we call it identity access and management in the, this business, IAM. And there's all sorts of things you need to do to be careful. You have to have good backups, obviously, and backups that are offline so that they can't be encrypted by malware. You have to monitor your network. You're right. Any computer that doesn't need to be on the Internet should not be on the Internet. But if it's on the corporate network and... And Joey's computer, the mailroom guy, is on the internet. <laughs> Doesn't matter. So there's this is a very complicated sub subject, obviously. There's a lot of, I mean, it's, I mean, I've just given you five or six techniques. There's dozens, um, and you have to do this all in a layered fashion. So honestly, uh, no small business. Certainly no big business, but no small business should just say, oh, we're going to be fine. Uh, you know, the IT guy can handle it. Uh, you probably want to have make sure that you have good 
either a really good IT guy, which we have, who's really up on modern security technique, or you bring in a yeah. consultant. Because as I, that's the other problem. This stuff changes fast. So you asked an interesting question. Can I block a geographic region? Yeah, you could. I uh, On my network-attached storage, for instance, I block China and Russia. But that doesn't mean that's where the attack came from. That email to the office manager might come from uh, downtown. <laughs> and, that would be that would be a blunt instrument, really. It would be to block an entire. Yeah, region. it's a very blunt instrument, and it works in some cases. There's, they've discovered. It turns out that the ransomware that was used against the Colonial Pipeline, yeah, uh, Ooh, yeah it uh, dark something. Anyway, it um, it d does an interesting thing. It checks to see if you have a Russian Cyrillic keyboard or a Syrian keyboard, a variety of different languages installed. Right. And it won't attack you if you do, presuming that you are in Russia or Syria or Azerbaijan or one of the states where... The, and there's a couple of reasons they do that. One, it may be their government-sponsored hackers, and so they're just trying to protect themselves. It may be they're not, but they don't want to get the Russian secret police on their ass. Exactly. So, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully diplomatic solution will work. A diplomatic solution, because some of these are state hackers. This is the new yeah. cyber warfare you know, they, uh, the head of the FBI just recently said this is our 9-11, you know. And it is in a way, it's a much more slow moving, but it could be as disastrous, uh, not in loss of life, but certainly an economic consequence. So yeah. it, it does need to be treated at a governmental level as well. That's just, But that's just one of the layers. Well, thank you so much, Leo. You, you have a great show. Hey, I'm so glad you listened. It's a great question, yeah. frankly. Okay. Take thank you. Yeah. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Rod Pyle's here. He's the space guy, editor-in-chief of Ad Astra, the space uh, magazine from space.nss.org. He's also the author of many fine books, Space 2.0, Amazing Stories of the Space Age. Oh, you said it just right. Amazing Stories <laughs> of the Space Age, Interplanetary Robots. I mean, I can go on and on. How many books have you written, Rod? Uh, 17. I'm starting an 18th for JPL in a couple of weeks. Nice. I, I do one of their annual 17. books on all their cool tech. Yeah. Wow. My aim is to do 25 by the time I'm too old to care or, or you're a keyboard masochist. write anymore. You're but. a masochist. That's hard <laughs> yeah. work writing a book. Each one's brutal, yeah. Ah, they're brutal. But it's fun. Yeah. So right. what's up in the world of uh, the space age today? Let's talk about Venus as I've often referred to it, even on your show, the trailer park of the solar system. No, no offense to trailer parks. Uh, Maybe I should makes, call it the Barstow of the solar what system. Makes it the, no, that will offend Barstow. What makes it yeah. the trailer park of the solar system? Well, you know... Nobody when, lives when, there, right? It's just a big bag of gas. Right. Yeah, it's just kind of run down. So when you and I were, were kids, we still didn't really know what Venus was all about when we were little. And, you know, there was this idea, well, it's kind of the same size as Earth. It's got the same basic gravitational field a little bit more you know maybe it's it's kind of like earth and earlier than that we even thought there might be swamps and dinosaurs and things there mm. it turns out it's a really nasty place it's mm. it's it's about 900 degrees on the surface 900 it's about 100 times atmospheric pressure of earth and it's got these big clouds of acid sweeping by which is why when probes finally landed there in the 60s the russians managed to do it finally uh, they didn't last long. You know, they a couple melt. hours and they were done. <laughs> yeah, the electronics failed. And this is the, the Soviet Union. And they used to, they, they used electronics because they, they weren't quite as far along as we were. So they'd seal them in a pressure vessel with nitrogen, you know. Wow. And some of their spacecraft actually even used vacuum tubes. But yeah. that's another story. So, but, but they did it, right? And all we managed to do is orbit and send down some atmospheric probes. So, so Venus NASA has a surface. It's got a rocky Surface. Oh, yeah, very. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, you wouldn't want to be on it because it's not only very hot, it's kind of acidic. <laughs> yeah, I think you'd say Venus ain't the play, kind of place you'd want to raise your kids more yeah. than Mars. Yeah. But it's got a hot, rocky surface. A lot of volcanic activity is apparent there. We did find that from Magellan and other orbiters. But NASA decided as part of their discovery program, which is their sub $500 million probes, which still sounds like a lot, but compared to the multi-billions, that's not bad. And they're going to send two back, one called Da Vinci Plus and one called Veritas. And they're both acronyms that are too long to, to bother saying. They'll uh, go back sometime in the next seven, eight years. 
This will be our first look at Venus in about 30 years. And part of what I think tipped the decision, there were, there are were four programs under consideration. Another one is going to get, going to go to Ganymede and one more to uh, Triton, the, the moon of Uranus. But they decide on Venus, I think, to some extent, because not long ago, maybe six months ago, uh, some scientists found phosphine in the atmosphere, which we think is an organic and uh, oh, may indicate life. It may indicate geological activity. That's what's frustrating. You know, you see some of these things, and is it volcanism? Is it life? What is it? But it could be life. So um, the Da Vinci probe is actually a drop probe that will go down into the atmosphere and parachute through and take measurements on its way down. So it's sort of like an atmospheric flyby, if you will. You know, you don't want to I mean, land. You're not going to land anything. Well, right? it'll land, but uh, it'll be over. I don't think it's it going to do much once it gets there. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's kind yeah. of like that one we sent to uh, Titan. Right. The Huygens probe. So it went down and it did transmit some pictures from the surface, but not for long. But the, but the main interest is to see these different belts of the atmosphere because there are parts of the atmosphere that are quite temperate and not, not nearly as nasty as down the surface. They're at, you could actually live there. You couldn't breathe it, but you could actually live there in terms of atmospheric pressure and temperature and all that. You have to have a suit that's acid proof, but that's okay. Most of that's down near the surface. And um, so that's really cool. And then the other one is called Veritas. And that's another radar mapping mission, but it's about 100 times, is what always happens, right? It's about 100 times better than what we sent with Magellan, which was in the mid-1990s. And so we'll be able to do high-res mapping of the surface and, you know, try and see more about what's going on down there. It looks like it is very volcanic, volcanically active, might still be. Um, so this is all very interesting, but recently, before these were announced... Rocket Lab had said, hey, we're going to send the first private probe to Venus and go into the atmosphere and look at it and all that. But they're a small company with limited resources, and I think uh, I think NASA just sort of ate their lunch. But we'll see. You know, I hope they still do it because it would be really, really neat to have a private company to take this on. Now, the one thing I wanted to ask you this week, uh, the U.S. government's report came the ufo <laughs> yeah. report came out what right. what did they find that there is aliens well, visiting it still us? hasn't come out it's just been leaked oh right? so they they kind of played the center line as a lot of people would have expected they said well we don't see any evidence evidence of extraterrestrial contact but we can't discount it either so <laughs> this is all i know this is all because you know members of congress finally said look We'd like to know more about this. And I think the other more legitimate concern besides just public awareness is the there's not much interagency cooperation. They kind of back away from this topic because it's kind of hooey hooey, you know. Yeah. And um, some of the branches of the military and DOD weren't really talking to each other much about it. So this is an attempt to really get a coordinated report out based, as I'm sure you remember, on those videos that were leaked in 2007 and then later. And there's some really compelling stuff there. I mean, th these things are moving. And, you know, we can only see the low-res FLIR radar stuff they've got, laser radar. But, you know, they've got the good data. And if they're saying that they're moving at speeds and trajectories that just don't make any sense in terms of known technology, then I, I kind of tend to believe them. And you start to worry a little bit about who's looking at us. But they didn't go so far as to say there's evidence of aliens we'll find out when the report they, comes out i guess it's not till june 25th i thought end of the month yeah, yeah. so yeah. so i think what we'll hear is we don't have any confirmed evidence of extraterrestrials but we also can't say they're not because we don't know what they we, are that we can make so we know it's not our stuff that that they did say they don't know about russia and china but these things can loiter for 12 hours at right. these different altitudes so that's actually the most useful information is it's not ours yeah we didn't even know that and, of course, we just have to trust that, right? Because we're not going to see what well, ours they could, they could be is. Lying. Yeah. <laughs> right. At this point, you know, there have been enough sightings, and some of them are old enough that if it were ours, they might be willing to say, yeah, yeah, that was a spy plane we were working on. But but yeah. they're not. They're saying fairly definitively, apparently, that it's not. And some of the Navy guys, you know, the Navy, Navy naval aviators who have seen these things have, have said there was that 60 Minutes report and a couple of other things came out in, in uh, print. It said, you know, for a while out in the Atlantic seaboard, they were saying these things every day. Everything from the Tic Tacs to hmm. the Triangle ships to just hmm. blobs. One of them on the Pacific coast just up and disappeared right in the middle of the observation, which is spooky. Given so, what you just said about uh, Venus, though, it probably is important to point out <laughs> yes. that our atmosphere and air pressure might be just as hostile to them as Venus's is to ours. That doesn't... 
That's just because, you know, anyway. Rod yeah. Pyle, Space Guy. Go to space.nss.org to find out more, read all his books, get his magazines. I, I think the one thing that still gets me about this is, well, two things. One, you know, we look at the size of these craft and we kind of think, well, so aliens, if they exist, are probably the same size as us. And why would that be? I mean, if I was an intelligent no. tech species and I was going to send something to Earth and I was that advanced. Ants. Yeah. They could be a giant. They're probably sending probes. I don't know. Yeah. And I and I you know I'd cram consciousness and intelligence and advanced AI into a little mechanical cockroach with all those extra legs and high survivability yeah. and say okay report back when you're yeah. done and don't get spotted and by golly you know looking at it from their side if they're that advanced and they're in orbit and they're able to cloak themselves we're not going to see them flying down around the ocean so that's what puzzles me unless they're going down to talk to the whales or something why do we keep seeing them they're smart enough not to do that there is a theory. That they're trying to ease us into this by appearing in little bits and pieces and, you know, abducting people and tipping cows in Iowa and all that. But I, I don't That's know. That's not easing us into it. You want <laughs> to ease us way to into do it, it. send us sure. some messages, say, hey, just thought you'd like to know. <laughs> well, or stage a comedy show. I mean, how did people get news for years? Jon Stewart, right? Right. Send us an alien comedy show. Yeah. And we'll sort of segue Something funny. Into it and people go, yeah. okay, that's kind of cool. Uh, you know, I don't know about these aliens, but they are funny. Exactly. <laughs> and got a good sense of humor. And I won't even go into, you know, news from Uranus and so forth. But you know where I'm going with this. I am, uh, as you know, I am the yeah, skeptic. skeptic. Mr. Well, I Pyle, am too, but I sure like talking about it. It's a fun thing. I, don't, I actually don't like talking about it only because it's just so unknowable. I just feel like mm. there's nothing to say, really. And this well, report is exactly that. It's like... Exactly. We have nothing to say. We have nothing to say. We don't know what it is. Still don't know what it is. Well, it'll be interesting to read it, for sure. But but I think you're one of the only radio people that I talk to anymore that isn't getting pressure from the network to talk about it more. You're kidding. No. I uh, All over WGN and a number of the other networks I do. It's good for you. Probably once a month. Yeah. Well, it's space stuff, yeah. But it, it is, again, I'm trying to sort of tread that middle line of saying I don't disbelieve it necessarily, but I don't see the evidence there. It's that old extraordinary claims that require extraordinary evidence thing, right? Right. right. And we just don't have the evidence yet. Yeah. We, we have hearsay. So, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, but you know I while you're up pressure. in Alaska, you might see one. I don't get pressure to do anything. I never even hear from the boss. I don't know. Anything. <laughs> well, that's good, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. That's all I ever wanted. It's funny because as a manager, I'm the same way. It's a, I just think, well, I don't. I never wanted to hear from my bosses, so I'm not going to give them any feedback. And then they go, you never give us any feedback. It's like, <sighs> sigh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're great. You're doing great. Keep up the good work. That's good. <laughs> that's what I think that's, of you. you that's know? it. You're doing great. Keep up the good work. I'll let you know. That's kind of the message from the radio people is, hey, we'll, you know, we'll let you know if we don't like it by firing you. <laughs> right. That's you, a simple there's message. There's no intermediate it? step. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm not like in remedial radio school. Uh, you know, either they like me or they don't. And if they don't, bye-bye. Right. I mean, that's all there is to it as far as the I'm only, concerned. The only real feedback I got once was uh, try not to talk quite so much like a boomer. Which I is don't hard. I know what that means. Well, uh, well, how do boomers talk? Well, we use words like neat and cool. <laughs> Sorry, and, uh, I don't take like that, that kind of advice. I talk like I talk. Again, I know. That's either you like me right? or you don't. I, it's, I like you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> honestly, that's my attitude's been is like, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, I am, I am what I am. I see you got an OK boomer under chat. <laughs> I do. I do. That's a classic phrase now. Hey, thanks, okay, Rod. Boomer. Have a good one. Okay, morning. take care. Take care. Thank you for letting me be your tech guy. And once again, I don't know how I keep getting away with this, but so far I haven't been caught. Uh, this is, this is uh, I'm sorry to say, the last segment of the weekend. Uh, this is where I traditionally say to Professor Laura, our musical director, thank you for being a charm to work with, just so much great music and fun. That, and of course, she keeps me in line and says, Leo, you, did, <laughs> you didn't do your ad this week. Oh, darn it. I also thank our great friend and uh, phone angel. I've known her for ages, Kim Schaffer. She's the person who gets you ready for your appearance on national radio. Of course, the most important person, as far as I'm concerned, is you. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you for calling. Thank you for doing this for, as I mentioned earlier, 17 years. And uh, there's absolutely no way they'd let me do this if you didn't listen. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Couple of, time for a couple more calls. Let's see here. Uh, Dana's on the line from Mission Viejo, California. Hi, Dana. Hey, Leo Laporte, the genius tech guy. <laughs> well, I don't, let's not go crazy. <laughs> what can I do for you? <laughs> uh, question. Yes. I um, bought a replacement computer, a laptop by Dell, which is on MS-10. Okay. And it has just WordPad, where my old computer, it was some, uh, Samsung, had um, a good a good office writing program. Was it Microsoft Office or some third party? Uh, you know, I don't know with the old one. With all, so Microsoft Office, I mean, I guess it's possible that uh, a computer came with it, uh, like they bought it and put it on there. They certainly would add to the price of the computer and add a considerable amount for the perpetual license. They often these days put trial versions, so there might have been a trial version. But I should tell you that it may well be that Samsung, and I don't know, I'll have to check, puts one of the open source free offices on there. They're quite good. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know if you've used LibreOffice, L-I-B-R-E, but you could put it on your current computer for free. It's open source. It reads and writes Microsoft Office documents. Uh, and it's it's excellent. They may have put Microsoft Works on there. I don't think Microsoft still makes this. For a while, that was included. That was kind of a cheap version, kind of like Notepad, a cheap version of Office. Notepad is a free version of uh, Microsoft Word. That was my reason for the call to connect with you because I snooped around and found LibreOffice. Yeah. Dot org. Oh, good. And before I... It's now, excellent. It infected my computer. With oh, no, no, it's safe. I want to know that it was I, Every one of my computers has LibreOffice on it. There are others. There was a, it's a based on a program that predated it called OpenOffice, and then the OpenOffice was forked, so you, the OpenOffice still works. LibreOffice is my favorite of the two. It is amazing when you download it that it has all the capabilities, you know, of Microsoft Office for free. Yeah, this uh, Dell just came with WordPad, which has literally no, doesn't even do spell check. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's because Microsoft wants you to buy Office, Office 365. And or you have to uh, renew it every year. For every you. year, so. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's a nice little uh, bit of income for them on the side. Right. So uh, I have, tell people all the time, use LibreOffice. Yeah. Now, it's because it's open source. It's a little clunky. Maybe it's not as elegant or polished, although it's, I think it's pretty close. You might find that it's um, like, I don't, what, do you use Word mostly or do you use Excel? Uh, Word. And, and I put photos in there for my wife to embed into a letter and then print the letter. Yeah, and, and there, there's no way to tell with WordPad how many pages you're going to use. Oh no, no, yeah, do use use LibreOffice. It's basically they're attempting to be as complete as Word. Uh, their spreadsheet program Calc looks just like uh, uh, Excel. Has many of the functions. Um, you know, if you're an Excel wizard and you use it for work, you, it may not have all the tools that you expect. But I would say for 99% of us, LibreOffice has everything you need. Right. And it's completely safe. If, I mean, if that's the real question, uh, I, would, I would definitely use LibreWriter. And in fact, as I said, I put it on all my computers. I do actually subscribe to Microsoft Office, uh, or as they call it, Microsoft 365 now. Right. But um, that's more because so I can talk about it and it's more for work. Um, you, you know, and maybe if you wrote a, if you were a novelist, you'd want to use Word, I guess. I would think a novelist would not want to use Word, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, there is the one other thing you should know about is that Office is available for free online. It's a web-based version of Microsoft Office. Oh. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I'm not sure why Microsoft does it, <laughs> to be honest. But it, if she's used to Word and is used to the Word interface... Um, that's that's worth uh, checking out too. You do need a Microsoft account to it. It's at office.live.com. Oh, okay. So anytime you use it, you have to be online. Yes, which is the 
negative. Yeah. I think you, 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 I try LibreOffice, and I think you're going to like it. I'm going to use it. Too. I'm glad you found it, Dana, actually. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Thanks Thank for the call. You. I appreciate it. Last call of the day. Harry from Fallbrook, California. Hello, Harry. Hi. How you doing? I'm great. Uh, my, my question is, um, can, can a smartphone be hacked? And if it, if it can be hacked, is there any way of knowing that? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> So it's it's much more unlikely. Smartphone operating systems, iOS and Android, were developed long, much later than Mac and Windows. And as a result, when they developed them, they knew the security hazards that you know uh, smartphones would be susceptible to. So they are, for most intents and purposes, well locked down, and they are, and your data is encrypted. However, if you download Russian wallpapers from internet, maybe you get hacked. Sometimes it is completely possible to modify your phone in such a way that you would not know that only a forensics expert could tell. In fact, most of the time, if your phone's hacked, it'll be like that. Unlike a computer where you'll get a, mess, a ransomware message. Because when people hack smartphones, what they're doing is not ransomware. Usually they're doing it to surveil you. So I'm going to guess your question really is, could my smartphone be surveilling me? Yeah. Yeah. And it could be. It's highly unlikely unless you've made an enemy with some very special skills. So hacking, there's two kinds of hacking. There's targeted and there's mass hacking. Most of the hacking we talk about is mass hacking where they send an email out to everybody. Uh, you know, they, the viruses you encounter are mass attacks. Those you can easily defend against. Your smartphone, you're probably perfectly defended against. Just don't download weird software from strange places. If you are, however, a celebrity, a politician, if you work for a three-letter agency, if you're a target, in other words, that's another matter. And those people usually have very good security to protect them. That's why they don't let the president walk in the Oval Office with his BlackBerry. <laughs> no way, man. So I think you're all right, Harry, unless are you a spy? Uh, no, uh, absolutely not. Uh, you, you know, before you were talking about uh, this guy was saying uh, someone using the word gate, uh, he must be a boomer. Well, I like to use far out. Where does that place mean? <laughs> you're a hippie and I love it. <laughs> That's oh. far out, Harry. <laughs> cool, man. Thanks for joining me. Have a wonderful day, man. Be cool. We'll see you later. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, this Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.